Today is January the 2nd, 2022. Happy uh, New Year to everyone. And to start off the meeting, we have uh, Hugh posted, um, don't know what to say, but there was just this, about an hour or so ago, he posted uh, a post. So how, how do you want to oh, tackle Oh, no, it's Joe Rogan. I saw oh, Joe Rogan okay, it's Joe Rogan. Dr. Rogan. Dr. Robert, but you can't say Dr. Robert's name. Okay, that that's, gotcha. that's a trigger word already. Yeah, I think I, I got dinged already for something of his. But okay. Yeah, don't don't say the V word, just say jab and just just say Dr. Robert because yeah, it's 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 really explosive. I'm only halfway through, but um <laughs> it's amazing. I don't think they're they're gonna be able to walk this one back. Uh it really just blows the the can off it. I mean, Joe, Joe Rogan had 120 million views just on that comet thing with, uh, you know, um, Graham Hancock and those guys. I, I think this is going to be in the hundreds of millions. And it's, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's such a big bomb. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a trigger word. <laughs> so I, I don't, I, I'm just amazed, but anyway, I, I thoroughly. I, I'm not. I normally watch things at like twice speed. <laughs> this thing I'm watching at normal speed, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah. There's just one or two things I would like to say that might not come across, but then one of them is, uh, I I hope it's coming across to you. What I mean, I I know everybody thinks I'm a complete nutcase, and for that conspiracy theorist, but like. Are you starting to get the picture? Just notice how many times that Dr. Roberts talks about his background and how many times he mentions CIA, HIV, and they're like defense bioweapons research. That That's, <laughs> they, they all like this, right? This, this, it's a blend, a complete blend. And all of these guys is doing, there's no good stuff in this. They, all of the dual use stuff, everything they do is dual use. So I'm just, I'm just saying. I was just getting to the part where the guy was saying about immunodeficiency, and my, <laughs> and he was. So I just stopped it now. The part where where Joe Rogan was saying, "Oh, you know, shingles and <laughs> getting all this stuff." Like, oh, no. <laughs> like I, I've, I saw that. I saw all of these things. These are things from HIV. <laughs> it's just again and again. I can't say it enough. HIV and. You, you you can't find it. It's being purged. I mean, viciously purged. The, the suppress and suppress is this this connection. But anyway, Sophie, you were saying something interesting before we started, and we thought we'd better you know get the recording going. But yeah, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Saying? I'm sorry to have yeah started the thing before the recording. But yeah, um, that Dr. Robert, I heard him first in the summer when he joined a group of um, general practitioners um, and actually family doctors in Canada who who had been stricken off the various jobs they had and positions because they wanted to give informed consent. They were not uh, anti-jabbers, uh, but they were cautious and they were saying what Dr. Robert's saying, uh, reserved for special cases, elderly and fragile people. And uh, they were not in favour of the kids being included and the young people. So anyway... He, he got a name there that I, I so I followed him because I saw his credentials and it's quite impressive. But what was very interesting is that he mentioned that I, I'm, a, I'm roughly at the same place where you are into listening to the talk. But he he mentioned early that the, the the person that tried to shut down the first studies on the treatments that were, for example, given in India is the same woman who was implicated in the FDA with the problem of the oxycontin. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same person, you know. So we're talking about a, a real lobster part of people. It's just, yeah. I, I think maybe maybe it doesn't come across to people outside America that um, that there's a big disconnect 
I think particularly in people in Britain where, you know, um, medicine is kind of seen as a right. And I don't think people in the rest of the world understand that it is the biggest business in America. It is it is rapacious. It's utterly ruthless, uh, completely un money oriented. It's um, it's a den of thieves and it's, ex it's extraordinary profits. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a, a nest of gold bugs in there. And that and so I think that doesn't come across with the NHS and cheap medicine and stuff that you don't have this association with big business. And we're talking mafia, mafia style, big business. I mean, it's, it's, they, they it, it's just the, the mafia and all the, the drug dealers, they just went legit. They just said, look, we can do much better getting FDA approval for our drugs than, you know, just selling them direct on the street. And that's what's happened. And it's all in there with the, um, you know, with the medical insurance industry and then with the government and the, the VA. It's one, one third of the U.S. economy is just going into this crap. So it's it's just it's just a den of thieves, you know. It's just a, And then, you know, I, and then I notice get downvoted like hell. If you say anything about anti-science, anti-medicine, anti-hospitals, it's like, oh, they hate it. They say, like, guys, wake up. You, you're not... You, you, they're not in your, they're not trying to help, they're not in the business of health, right? They're in the business of money. So if, you, if you're interested in health, you're interested in nice hospitals and stuff, then get rid of the system. You stop supporting it. Stop downvoting me if I say that it's, you know, pointing out all its flaws. It's like people need to wake up. This is not, the doctor's not your friend. The doctor's a fucking enemy. I had a I had a little group of of women who were with me for New Year, and one of them works in a hospital, and she was asking me loads of questions because I'm, I'm an ex doctor and stuff like that. So I I showed her a paper that I got from the what we call the HSC here is the Health and and Safety uh, whatever body that works that supervises everything hospitals doctors etc. And they send a report they send reports to doctor regularly on epidemiology statistics and stuff. And because I I don't know, I didn't change my email and I'm still on their mailing list. So they still send me all their statistics. So I received this um, report. I, if you like, I'll I'll send it to you individually because I, I don't think it's material to post on, on Reddit. But it's um it's the statistics on the deaths, hospitalization, vaccine oh status of patients. No, but you know, uh, since uh, ju from June to December 2021. Um there is um, there is little there's an introduction that's extremely that praises the job and the conclusion is it's a 20 page report with graphs it's very boring to read but the conclusions are both the the narrative that we all know but when you go into the the figures uh, for example i think it was december uh, 63 percent of deaths were in jabbed uh, there was ICU same. I mean, it was just going. And if you, I, I'll send it to you if you like. But when I showed that to that girl who works in administration, a very big hospital here, she just couldn't believe it. And I had to show her the heading. It's there. Now, we have we're not as controlled as the states. We we still have some um, civil servants who are working. You know, who are not who don't have conflict of interest. So they publish these things, and they, it's just probably corrected. You know, it's just the introduction and the conclusion is just change to fit the narrative so that the, the doctors who read that they just don't bother looking at all the graphs and the numbers they say okay they said it's good yeah it's and I, I you'll see anyway the figures speak for themselves yeah i posted something similar from the figures from denmark and that's kind of shocking it's basically the the people that have pre-infections and the people that that, that are jabbed <clears throat> Have way, way more, more chance of winding up uh, in hospital. I mean, we're talking eighty-three percent versus seven percent. So it's it, it, in a population that's you know kind of eighty percent jabbed. So <clears throat> you know, this, I know, this, I know this, that's shocking. In, in Dr. Roberts' thing, is that he, he, he actually the study I've written it down somewhere, and I want to read it because he talks about natural immunity versus um, because he says that personally. He got jabbed for 
one or two reasons that he mentions, but one of the, uh, he, he, he got it and uh, he, he just said, well, I, I didn't really want to get vaccinated, but I had to travel, oh, to travel. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, he, he real, he, there's an article that's absolutely uh, seems to be very serious about the, the strength of natural immunity as opposed to uh, jabbed immunity. Uh, that is also in total contradiction with the official narrative um, that they're banging into people's head constantly. Yeah, I, I always just come back to this thing about if if this thing is frigging with your immune system, this is the pattern you would see. You'd see a, a bit of relief, you know, basically immediately for about three months after a jab, and then you'd be in worse position than you were, and that's what the figures are showing. So it's like, I I don't know, man. <laughs> I well, we'll see how it develops, but uh, South Africa is. Over the peak, you know, it basically it went down as fast as it went up. Here in uh, Greece, it's, it's going through the roof. It's like, um, but uh, deaths don't seem, they seem to be constant. The only place where it's not going through the roof is Japan. Um, because I was looking at it and they seem to have, um, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a complete different pattern of approach. Um, I, I, it would be interesting because, Mike, you're going to be you're going to be in contact a lot with Japan in the future, and you're going to be able to, to see for yourself. And I I'm sure so, that you're yeah. with, with what's going on there, it's it's quite interesting to observe. <clears throat> so voluntary, there, right? <clears throat> they don't. They're not even pushing. Yeah. Right. As far as I know, there's no mandates, and um, that's also on their ministry on um, uh, health ministry website. They explicitly say they're not going to um, force or, you know, these jabs. Yeah, the jabs. Yeah, I keep on posting all of these things. It's like, it's, oh, man, it's such a weird time. As you see all these people, like hundreds of thousands of people, and it's starting to get a little bit rough out there, uh, all these protests, and they will not report them. You just, the PBC, everything is like blanket silence. It's just, I mean, who can not? finally wake up in this this era the people you know it's it's like spencer and all those guys who dissed us for being you know anti jab it's like where are those guys coming from i mean can't they see that what's going on it's like this is bad man <laughs> it's really bad anyway well on unless anybody's getting something else to say on that i, I just wanted to make an observation i was saying like we should try get exxon med up to a thousand members and then get out of dodge and our membership's going down, and so I, I, I'm a little bit suspicious um, because I think they, I think they're not the st stats are not right. They, they're gaming it, and so I, you know, it's very hard to tell. But I try to do these tests. I put things up, and you know, I, I to some very like low view videos or something very old videos and stuff and then see how many people are active and how many people look to try and get a feel for it so i can't be absolutely sure but i think what they're doing is they they're definitely running algorithms because we've got all those bots that came and play, plagued us but they but they they i think what they're doing is they're nudging they they're training they're training uh, the sub um on on so they kind of reward you with members as if you your membership's growing, even though it's absolutely fake. And then if, if you if you use the wrong keywords and go a bit against the grain, do a few websites, make a few associations that are not right, then they start, you know, winding them back. But if you look at the pattern of the times when those things, you know, people unsubscribe and stuff, they look... Uh, they look scattered. They don't look like a, a cluster around, you know, you can definitely see a cluster of people in America come online, cluster of people in Australia, cluster of people in the, in the UK is our audience. So you, you, you know the time zones and you can you get a good idea for where people cluster and when they're using it. And they, they also tell you, you know, like eight online, which I trust those kind of thing. But then... Um, the unsubscriptions and stuff don't correlate well. They correlate much better with the, with the, with a, with a bot. So anyway, I'm just putting that out there because I'm not sure if we really want to pursue 
a thousand K so since it's just a training algorithm where they're trying to nudge you into saying the right thing and shape the narrative. Oh, and I'll post videos of my cat and it will just start to rise again, you know. <laughs> uh well yeah i mean no i mean no if you really want it to rise start start doing pro big tech narratives so if you if you start you know i you see i did that that one spoof thing where where i you know was i did that sarcastic thing like what is wrong with these anti anti jabbers and <laughs> I got a lot of upvotes very, very quickly. And I was like, are these, do these guys know it's sarcastic? Or are these bots? Or are these people that are just clueless? I got the idea that a lot of people upvoted because they didn't know it was ironic. Yeah, but in my opinion, I think the membership was going much uh, faster up. It, it grew from 600 to 900 uh, suddenly, and then it's plateaued. But when there was much more about the climate, when we were more about collapse, and I think collapse is a kind of a magnet. I know it's not a, a very, <laughs> I'm talking about membership, but you know, I, I maybe we just want to, because recently there's been much less about that. Well, there are always some, but there, you know, I don't know. Yeah, you might be right there. Um... You know, the prepping and the, the whole lot and the, the, all this sort of stuff. Uh, if it's just to get membership, who cares? Like, because if we can change the name and move to a, move to another thing afterwards, it doesn't really matter, does it? Oh yeah, no, it's just as a target, just as a parting, just mm. to to close it up nicely in case you know somebody came back afterwards and said this is completely fringe or something. You say, <laughs> oh, it's not fringe. Thousand thousand members, you know that kind of thing. People people tend to do that, so it's like. I just thought we we just want to put a bow on it um, when we leave. Uh, but yeah, I, I, on that point, um, yeah, I, I thought I was going to have the manifesto finished today, the first draft of the manifesto finished today, but I didn't make it. I still got a couple of days. It's taking me a long time to to get this. I'm putting a lot of links in and stuff, and then I keep on following the links and going down all these rabbit holes there's such a lot of interesting stuff out there um but uh yeah I, I i will in the next couple of days i promise i will get the first draft out there then we can start discussing that and then it's all collapsology and stuff like that um uh, I, I, yeah. I also wanted to say that i i got a confirmation i told i told lord hugh but i didn't tell the other ones that i had invited for new year's eve the irish uh, rep of DGR and she is happy to uh, give us an interview in January and she's going to see Mark Boyle today so she's going to give us some fresh news and I'm really happy she's going to come on because she's a really interesting person because she's tried to uh, she has experience because she she even tried to to use a political platform here in a little party called People Before Profit because she tried to get into the game just because she wanted to to forward the agenda of DGR. So she's tried to, to, to go into, she even was involved with XR at the start. So she's got a good knowledge of all that. And she's she has a view very similar to what we have on the whole thing. So I think we could have a very interesting exchange with her. So uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, she'll be free for an interview. And Paul Kingsnorth is also probably around, right? <laughs> I'm sure that'll be an interesting conversation. But um, well, a, a no response from Sabine um, Hoffenfelder. No, she didn't respond to my very... I, I, I wrote to the email that was on her YouTube channel. And no, I want... I did the question exactly as I posted in your email there. I wanted to discuss, uh, you know, the... the the change of the not the what well, the I didn't use the word flipping, but I uh, know, but she didn't answer. Oh, that's a pity. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we we'll try try again um, soon in the new year when people people might be a little more focused. But, yeah. yeah, but at least people do eventually get to the, the mailbox. But let's let's see. Um, yeah, the first I feel the first thing is to get the 
get the manifesto out there and then we can start promoting stuff and, um but yeah I, is is this a large document you produced I, I, you know the manifesto like is quite extensive 20 pages sort of, sort of thing mm. Mm. yeah i'm trying to yeah I'm trying to put everything in one place because um i feel that we should be able to tell people you know what we want about because it's you know i was thinking we it should be obscure all the, i'm thinking all these years it should be obscure and people get into it but now I realized um people are not interested in getting into obscure stuff people's tolerance for anything unusual any anything off message and stuff is is really low now Not the not the old days where Tintin would go and you know, find interesting shit. <laughs> sleuthing. Nobody's a sleuth anymore, is it? Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking that when um, Sophie was just talking about the, the membership seemed to go up when we were posting the collapse topics. Um, but you see, the, the collapse topics are easily digestible. You know, they they more got more entertainment value, whereas you know when you post things that require a bit of thought, um, uh, you know maybe that does lose members because they're not willing to put the mental effort into into it. It's not they're not instant gratification things. So yeah, people want doom confirmation. I think I think they're depressed and they want doom confirmation. It's nice to to get an affirmation that your doom is justified. I think that's what the doom scrollers are doing and stuff and collapse. Is it, it's, there is a strange evolution. What's uh, been going on is that, um, you know, the, it's funny how these things, you think things don't matter or it's water off a duck's back. But, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the, planet of the humans and so there's been such a sea change after that i, I think you know there are all these kind of milestones that pass you, you get a something like that it comes out you get a big backlash and you think well that's that nothing happened no didn't change anything and then you notice suddenly it all changes i've, I've not i've noticed there's been such a big sea change in all these people that believe that you can do solar panels and esg and electric vehicles and nobody's saying all that shit anymore. There are more and more people getting the picture that we're a little bit screwed. And, and I'm seeing more of a tone of the people saying like, oh, but you know, you can always make things better. It doesn't matter. We probably, you know, it doesn't matter how screwed we are. We can always make it better. And it's like, I'm trying to discourage that thought because that's, that's this <clears throat> collapse denial that they're moving into like Michael Mann's collapsed and I, we can always make it better. Said, no, you can't. It's like, it's a tipping point. You, you, you know, the dominoes have gone. It's like, you know, okay, we shut the guy through the head, but we can always make it better. It's like, no, <laughs> once you pull the trigger, it's done, over. <laughs> but these guys have this um, sense of agency that, that I think is what got us into this you know, predicament in the first place is this sense of superiority and agency and control and say no we only have the control to, to push a boulder off the, off the cliff and cause an avalanche we don't have, a, have any control over the avalanche it's all this thinking like well we have the ability to make the avalanche we have the ability to control it no it doesn't work that way you can fuck things up it doesn't mean you can fix them jesus but the uh, people are stuck on us you know Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bye -bye. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Oh, Ryan, Ryan is here. Hi, Ryan. It's, um, oh, I, sorry. Uh, I, I thought I was still on mute. <laughs> I, no, I, uh, I, sorry about it. it wasn't, we didn't have this. The one in the morning, but we we decided last week 
not to do them <laughs> the one in the morning because it was like just holiday fever and stuff. So people just said, okay, we'll just do one and we'll next next weekend, next Sunday, let's do let's do two. Yeah. Um any Gary, anyway. Gary, you commented under the meeting that you, you had some ideas for discussion today, Gary. Do you know you were in the in the comments yeah the yeah I, I mean i i just put it there i, I i'm not uh uh, uh you know i mean it's if we get on to other things which we've already done um uh it was basically uh the uh confusion over abigail thorn philosophy tube apparently being uh hijacked by by the system and um uh, the other thing was uh, uh, the, the discussion between Bob and Hugh about uh, uh, Paul King's North. Um, so I, I don't know, has anyone else got any burning questions or will we, we go into either of those a bit? Has, has somebody else got a uh, burning issue there? I uh, well, just one thing which I found interesting, um, which I think Ryan will find interesting, is that I found this video on number file, which was um, uh, there's there are two guys that make maths videos on number file, and then there's uh, one two blue, one brown. I think is the other guy. Three um, three blue, run, one brown. Three blue, one brown. <laughs> yeah, um, and. Uh, it was about um, the, the Russell paradox and how, you know, again, it's random is strange. It really matters on how you construct it. So the, it was a really interesting video on that. But it was more to the point of what we were saying is that there's no such thing as random. It's uh, it's very much depends on how you how you construct it. Which is which is amazing because it's you know it's very much the a lot of the stuff in maths is you know pick an arbitrary this and pick a random that and everything done in clinical trials and then randomized testing and all so it's it's extraordinary that people don't realize they take it for granted that there's this thing called random and you say like no it's a fiction but so a lot of the stuff the pillars of our society and academia are built on on sand and uh, that nobody seems to realize it. Are there any proofs of randomness? Has anyone tried that? I imagine they have. No, no, that was what I was saying. The that friend of mine who was who was hired specifically to do that. <coughs> that these guys had a random number generator, and he was yeah. hired as a consultant to do a proof that it was actually random. And so he he waltzed in there thinking, "Yeah, this is should be no problem," um, and then quickly astounded himself, saying, "Like, hang on a minute." There are no proofs of, of randomness and anything, you know. And the more he got into it, the more he realized, hang on, there's a big hole in the whole of science and math. He's a mathematician, he didn't know that until he actually had to try and prove something that random. Then he realized what Gregory Chaitin and all these guys have been saying is this randomness is, uh, there is no such thing. Ra randomness is a fiction. It's like, oh, okay, there's no order, there's no structure, there's like, no, that's <laughs> you've got to you've got to look at the mechanism that you got the number sequence from to know whether you know whether it's random or not. Well, I, so, I think you I think you just um, brought up something that might also be fictional, which is order. Order may not be real. Yeah, or yeah. Conversely, order is also. <laughs> Not real. It's kind of in the eye of Boulder. Is it, but this is fascinating stuff. I mean, this is this is way bigger than you know why there is something or nothing. Uh, it's it, and it's not part of anybody's dialogue, as far as I can see. But this is far more important than religion, or science, or epistemology, or something. Is like, is is there anything? You know, a whole a whole society is based on order. And he's saying, what what is order? And, and formal axiomatic systems and uh, you know uh, if you go to court and you go through a court case what they're trying to do is 
you know, through a formal axiomatic process, get to an ordered society. Like nobody ever said the whole legal system might be impossible. Provably so, by mathematics. <laughs> it has actually been done, and nobody wants to look at it. So, well, all these conservatives out there want an ordered society, and they're like, what are you asking for? Show me what order looks like, uh, mathematical proof, and uh, I'll give it to you. I'll order our society around it. So all these things, the Great Reset, the One World Order, all of these things, they're all grand schemes for control and order. And so you said, like, what are you doing, guy? <laughs> they're like, well, you know what order is. It's the opposite of chaos and randomness and anarchy. They're like, explain. <laughs> Uh, see, we take all these things for granted and nobody asks. So, you know, then you get all these things in politics like anarchy through order. And they say like, oh, this is anarchy. Okay, well, anarchists will tell you that the O in the OA symbol stands for order. It's order through disorder. And you can, a lot of the guys say, you know, it's, it's all conflicted. Like a lot of the things about the invisible hand of the, of the market and all of these things it's saying like, you know, uh, if there's, it's totally laissez-faire economics and nobody interferes, then order will arise, efficiency will arise automatically out of the disorder. That's the very first economist, Adam Smith, said that. It's like, is that true? <laughs> let's let's see a little mathematical proof, Adam. <laughs> Do you uh, think, when just thinking about your You've spoken a couple of times about the universe as a sort of fractal thing unfolding. Um, isn't that a kind of an order? No, because the um, <laughs> well, you see, the the thing is, the whole it's a it's a a badly formed question. The the whole thing about is the world ordered or disordered or what is case? It's an ill-formed question, just like, you know, do we have free will? It's a stupid question. It's like a meaningless thing. So like, who do you mean by we? Who do you mean by free? So it's, it's, it's the same um, uh, that you can't say, you know, if you said yes or no, it would be wrong because you're just looking at it wrong. So I'll give you an example. Take, for instance, Darwinism. And so, you know, the... Uh, people won't let go of this idea of, you know, it's, it's obvious, the fitter survives. It's, you know, Spencer, the Herbert Spencer's idea, the, you know, the uh, survival of the fittest. And then they, they tell you, no, 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 don't say that. Say it's the f survival of the better <coughs> adapted. But, I mean, Wallace, Alfred Wallace, that was his favorite fa phrase, survival of the fittest. So Alfred Wallace did far more than Darwin to promote Darwinism. In fact, he believed in Darwinism a lot more than Darwin did. And so, yeah, Darwinism is survival of the fittest. So forget it, junior biologists, that is the correct phrase. So then you've got to say, what is fit? <laughs> what is fit and what is the unit of fitness? And so wherever they look, they get it wrong. If they look at the population level, then they will get into a big fight because they say there's no group selection. If they look at it in the individual level, like Darwin thought, then it doesn't work out because you have altruism and Hamiltonian spite, and then you can have, you know, all these collective organisms and new social organisms. Oh, by the way, you see, like E.O. Wilson just died. That was sad. But anyway, E.O. Wilson was the first person who talked about the superorganism. And uh, and once you look at, you know, it, it's like uh, there's a way better book than any of these idiots like Dar like Dawkins comes up with. Is is Gödel Escherbach. By Douglas Hofstadter and Doctor, and so he addresses this question of, of, in a way, of you know what is the what is the entity, and so he has this idea of you know Aunt Hillary. It's a joke because you know one of the characters is an ant hill <laughs> called <laughs> Aunt Hillary, <laughs> and um, you know it's like what 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 is it? I mean, it's a collective of autonomous ants, but it's you know. Has it is a superorganism. So if you if you ha if you have superorganisms in nature, where do they stop? Where do you draw the line? What is the the what is the unit of selection? So then you know they go down. The Price and Hamilton went down to the to the molecule and said, "Well, 
It must be the gene. That's the atom, the atom of selection. So, ha ha, got you. And you can't get any smaller than that. So that must be the unit of selection. You say, yeah, but it's strung together on a strand of DNA or RNA with all its pals. It's got all these histones and you know methylates and they all this epigenetic selection and stuff. So it's like a gene can't exist on its own. You can't have a gene and say like, I'm the gene for Dickie Dawkins and and then you say, like, well, it doesn't work without the lung gene and the oxygen gene and the blood gene. And the so what are you saying? That are oh, the genes? It's meaningless. The whole idea of, of Darwinian selection is utterly meaningless. Because when, as soon as you look at what the unit of selection is, there is no correct, there is no correct boundary. So you can say, like, what, what is the, the unit of selection for a gene in an oak tree? What, the forest? The whole of Germany, the whole planet. What's what's the unit that's fighting for <laughs> survival? And you say, well, well, it's whatever it procreates, it's whatever you know it gets to procreate. And you say, like, well, I mean, mitochondria get to procreate, and they're not even part of the genome; they're just coming along for the ride. But you, you're not going to live without mitochondria. But mitochondria were captured; they're a foreign organism. <laughs> So what's the What are you talking about? It's horseshit. It's utter horseshit. But our whole, just our whole to... politics and our, our economics and you know people's survival strategy is based on this Darwinian horseshit. Hugh, um, something in what we've been talking about is just making me think of relativism. Uh, I, a long time ago, you and I had a discussion about um, the, the sort of axioms on which we build so much uh, human, um, I don't know what you would call it, you know, intellectual structures built upon axiomatic uh, assertions. And uh, so, you know, in a sense, a lot of the human enterprises is this business of building castles in the air. Um, but I'm just thinking about, going back what you were saying about um, uh, the proofs not being proofs of randomness or proofs of order, and and then if you start to accept that that you know we're selecting these axioms that we can't be sure that they're true and and proceeding uh, to do amazing things on the basis of something that might not be correct. But uh, I'm just just a thought that came to me was that this all sort of connects with actually connects. Uh, back even with the Abigail Thorne videos, the philosophy tube, where um, there was just so much relativism there that you were left floating around. It, it, we, we, it, is, is the fundamental thing that we're dealing with in talking about all of these things, uh, uh, the, the human struggle with trying to reduce the stress of, of being in a totally relativistic setting? You know, that we're trying to establish some fixed thing to hang on to for fear of being blown away by by everything being um, uh, that, you, that we can't determine anything for certain. I don't know if that question makes any sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. So I wouldn't call them axioms, they, they unexamined assumptions. And I think the whole the whole point of it is we're nuts, we're absolutely barking stark raving mad and we don't realize it so you know if you if you look at say okay if you've got uh, abigail thorne's videos and the, the philosophy uh, in them and stuff there, there's this kind of you know point by point by point if if you did like a good rule numbering on each one of the points and analyze them uh, you could basically show Pretty pretty well that uh, basically they were inconsistent or incomplete, and that's that's the essence of it. Is is you can get order in a in a sense uh, because you can get pattern symmetry and stuff like that, but it's only local, and I think that's the the big problem is people are trying to get universals, so they're trying to get universal truths and absolute truths, and then. You know, and then people are trying to like water things down and make them all relative. So you have like, oh, there aren't any genders. You know, we're gender fluid, and there's 27 types of gender, and so you don't get binary. But 
you know you can you can play that game forever there's just uh, there's no truth um or or untruth in that and it it begins to look like um you know the gladiators in at the circus maximus they they're just pitting against you know, um the retiaris against the secator so they're kind of two principles like a kind of a yin and yang or the male and female principles and they're just endlessly playing so you you know you you can see it it's a, it's a big uh endless game but uh the you see they they it's massively contradictory because what you know you said that they're trying to uh reduce anxiety they're trying to beat death so the the thing that's doing all of the stupid game is is primarily our alien cortex and what it's trying to do is it's trying to it's playing chess you know chess is like all about the death of the king right skok mat skok mat is checkmate so checkmate the word checkmate comes from skok mat which means means watch mat is death mat is the the ancient egyptian god uh, mat of pretty much death <laughs> kali and so so it's like trying to stay out of death so it's basically doing all these moves to stay out of this condition of death and that's pretty much what a alien cortex is doing continually playing playing chess but here's why it's contradictory is because it wants to nail the game forever so it, it wants to get to a point where it's one forever <laughs> and that's final and it's saying like it's the opposite of life it's trying to stay alive by achieving death so in other words the finality of that is a metaphor for death it's 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 in the pursuit it's trying to pursue life by pursuing death i mean a whole society is doing it you can see it in you know the global industrial society is the economists say well it's to make prosperity and make things better what they mean is for you to try and prolong life to try and do um, self preservation and look what so we've done we've killed our species know, on our planet in the yeah. pursuit of this trying to make things better in in a way uh then it's actually a good thing that um uh that it can't be demonstrated if something's definitely random or or definitely ordered because that that prevents establishing this fixed certain death position that you're talking about it, it kind of it, it's, it's a kind it's of not limit good or bad. is it is it good or bad that you can't square a circle it's just you can't square a circle. Well, but, but uh, well, not maybe not so. What, uh, maybe uh, just replace good or bad with with the fact that we've reached a limit there, um, and we can't. You know, the alien cortex or whatever it is about us can't proceed past that point. It, it, it's it's trying to, and it, it can't. It's reached the limit of what it can do to create certainty or to create death, as, as you term it. Um, so I mean, maybe that just in itself is a a, a, a an alarm bell. Um, the you know if 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 you've, you're trying to achieve some kind of universal explanation and you reach a limit beyond which you can't go, it might be an indication that you're heading in the wrong direction. But um, human beings don't seem to be getting the point. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things in life that are kind of meant to be contradictory. We always want to remove contradictions and get finality and get certainty and stuff like that. And so uh, people kind of think, you know, uh, there's a right thing and a wrong thing. But the, a lot of um, the strategies that life has are deliberately, in a way, contradictory. So, so in other words you're supposed to be a, a hypocrite so we always you know liberals and the left wing and all these progressives always they're always quick to prick out hypocrisy and oh you're a hypocrite because you're a climate activist but you still fly and so and they're thinking that there must be this perfect thing where you're a climate activist and don't fly and all your ducks are in a row and stuff and the, there's this kind of involution where we say like no it's actually optimal that we are hypocrites. So a lot of things, uh, you know, are things that are, well, like you, you should fly, 
and be a climate activist. And it's not wrong to call that hypocritical. That's all, you know, the stable state of the system. So in other words, in, in trying to sort out all the, you know, we, we are supposed to have incongruencies and we are supposed to have contradictions in, in our things. In other words, I'm, scr I'm struggling here. I'm trying to say that, that you are supposed to have some untruths and you shouldn't get to the point where you, you, you say, okay, I'll, I've reached a point of wisdom that I'll, I'll iron out uh, all the untruths or say that, you know, we're supposed to be hypocritical on this point. Uh, we, you know, that's that also is incorrect. So in other words, um, uh, I'm not doing explaining this very well, is that you, you shouldn't always, uh, the well, the optimum is not always being aware of the hypocrisy or allowing the hypocrisy. The stable state might be that, uh, you know, evil gets done um, and we're hypocritical about it and that's kind of good. So does that make any sense? I didn't do that very well at all. Oh, I, the way I thought about it was, um, let's say you are um, making a New Year's resolution to go to the gym, and then three months later, you decided you're not going to do that because you have other things you've got to do. And like, which which of those yous is the one that you're supposed to be consistent to? Like the um, if if you were to remain consistent entirely, then you'd be in a, an absolute immobile prison of your own design where you couldn't be flexible and uh, modify where you are. You'd just be trapped in your, in your web of uh, promises or, or um, uh, statements. And uh, it, you become crystalline and, and uh, just frozen in, in your, in your ability to, to interact with the world. Yeah, that that's that's it. So it's kind of like saying like we we think there's something absolute and right and wrong. So we want to get to the bottom of the right and wrong of the situation. So you're saying like, well, you know, we're prosecuting this in law, and that's logically inconsistent. Um, you know, it's people's brains made them do it, something like that. And then people want to get to the truth. So specifically, scientists and things like that say, well, the law must be corrected. Uh, because it's only people's brains doing this. And so then we're getting to a better place. And you say, no, they, we all too often discount the fact that the law might uh, be optimal being hypocritical. So in other words, the, that it may, might be people's brains made them do that and the law is an ass for prosecuting them. But it's, it's better off that way for some other goal like the survival of the species or something. So... You know, in other words, hypocrisy is not always wrong, and probably saying that hypocrisy is not always wrong might be wrong, because it leads people to say, oh, "Okay, hypocrisy is okay." Neither one of them is correct. In other words, so in other words, it's a kind of pickle you get into with a higher wisdom. If you think of it this way, if you utterly forgiving and you Christ-like, and you say, you know, okay, I forgive anybody murderers hitler everybody i forgive them and you say well it sounds pretty good um and you say well you know but uh, what's the counter argument the counter argument is you don't forgive hitler and you, you say well, but then you're a hypocrite because then you're not uh, you know uh, loving your enemy you're not uh, you know you're taking the log out of your brother your own eye before your brother's eye all of this kind of stuff and you say there's a there's another position that says you know, like, no, we're supposed to uh, condemn Hitler and be hypocrites. And that's the best for some longer goal, like survival of the community or the species or something like that. So in other words, Christ could be selling us a curve for, um, by doing, you know, by being forgiving. So in other words, I'm not getting this point across at all well. I'll have to think about how to communicate it. But the, the idea of a, pursuing a right or a, a wrong um, uh, you know, it basically, we might be doing something in our society that is um, is inconsistent uh, and wrong, uh, hypocritical. But you don't want people to know that. You want it to be that way and be stable that way. Not, I'm not getting this point across at all. Well. Anyway, the, um, I mean, imagine for, for example, politicians. Then everybody wants politicians to be good. 
And then everybody imagines this thing where we like, you know, every time the politicians do something bad, there's uproar and uproar and stuff, and everybody moralizes and you know, Mombio and um, um, all these guys start getting on their high horse about it. And they're thinking there's some place we, we get to that's better than this. And they're overlooking the fact that, no, that might be the best place to be where politicians are a bunch of shits and Mombio pointlessly points it out forever and ever and nothing happens. Does this connect uh, up very well with the idea of consistency? Uh, because we, we, we demand consistency too. Um, uh, you know, you, you get, for instance, to be friends with somebody on the basis of, the, of, of their consistent, the way they present themselves to you uh, over a period of time. You, you know, you think, uh, you think you know them to a certain degree, you're comfortable with them or they've got something that is, is satisfying. Um, and yet, um, uh, you know, because consistency relates to hypocrisy in the sense that, you know, that they, the person might not uh, be able to, to keep presenting that same persona. Um, and, and I wonder about that. I, uh, I suppose I'm speaking personally a, a bit that I've always found it very taxing to... Uh, to know people um, because I feel that they're, they're, they're constantly handing out an expectation that you remain the same. Uh, and I find it an impossible task. Uh, there's a certain, so it always seems to arise at, at a certain point where the consistency game can't be kept up anymore. Um, so I'm just wondering, it, it can, it, you know, uh, does that... Um... Yeah, uh, you see, it's a, the, I think the reason why people want consistency is that they're trying to farm each other. So we, we dreadful slave owners. We're always trying to you know, shape the world and enslave everything and have, you know, machine slaves, energy slaves working for us and getting, you know, always trying to get the world to suit us. Um, and so, you know, we... The great habitat creators, particularly, well, I mean, our alien cortex is, not our whole brain. But a large part of that, our demand for consistency in other people is so that we we can um, efficiently farm them and use them so that they're, they're reliable and consistent. And so you know, the, the essence of, of anti-slavery is being random. The reason why they put people in, in schools and school them, and particularly school them, for the clock is is because you have to have regular regularity to exploit the slave you can't you can't exploit a random number so the, you can't make a living out of a random number and so that's uh, that's a problem we're all trying to make a living out of each other um, and so that puts uh, you know that a social credit score is really a score on how reliable you are so in other words how machine like you are and consistent so, yeah. you know, if you want a lousy credit, social credit score, you just be a random. You just one day do random acts of kindness and one day do random acts of heinous, obnoxious if, behavior. If I may, I, I'd like to synthesize all the three topics. Uh, um, the order and randomness and um, and consistency uh, going to to the word that you said, Gary, which unifies them all, which is expectations. So we have, uh, when, when our expectations are violated, we'll maybe say, oh, that's chaotic or that's random uh, or that's inconsistent. When we, um, and, and the, the idea behind expectations is that we have a model of the world or behavior or some other pe person in our head. And we're expecting that to match our sense data right we're expecting the um the outcome to be uh to, to be matching that and when it doesn't then we have an expectation violation and then we get some chemical you know emotional response to that and that's where we hang the definitions of these words on so when you're talking about 
uh, entropy or something. You'd have a, a mug dropping and say, oh, it's increasing the entropy because, um, you know, you're creating disorder when the mug smashes on the floor. But really, that's just taking the expectation of object recognition of the mug and um, making it so that you can't recognize it anymore on the floor. And that, that smashing your expectation is a psychological hack. Um, same with the, the, the randomness, the consistency, all of that. And you're absolutely right that the, um, uh, for, for capital to be deployed, uh, capitalists need predictability. They need to be able to project out into the future and say, okay, if I deploy my capital, then there's a reasonable expectation of return. But if you have a chaotic environment um, where you, you're not really uh, able to predict anything, then then the the risk outweighs the the, the benefit to you. So um, that's that's why the Fed likes to telegraph. Oh, we're not going to raise interest rates for for a while. Don't don't panic. It'll be fine. It's all this you know making sure that you have the expectations still maintained so that you can um, continue to build structures on top of those expectations. Um, and that's what our economy is based on, what, what, uh, what our you know, social relationships are based on. But yeah, if you want freedom, uh, that's, that's somehow at odds with the, um, uh, in, in some sense, Freedom is the ability to break expectations. Yeah, so th there's risk involved in in having uh, unpredictability. So the, if you're a banker and these guys who are farming us, the, ultimately all the big cabal who's running everything, they're bankers, they're financiers. And their whole game is, is uh, extracting rent out of us. But you see, the the game is predicated on getting a regular purse or regular coupon on on each dollar in in circulation and and all the debt. Well, the whole thing is based on debt, right? So, so they charge a little bit of interest, and that interest is predicated on how much risk they've got to have a risk premium, and the risk is default or some random act of God. So, they if you if every investment went out and hedged against that with uh, bonding insurance to make sure you wouldn't be caught by surprise and you wouldn't you would lose your capital um, then the whole economy wouldn't be worthwhile so the whole economy is based on a fraud because it's based on on the fraud that uh, the interest actually covers um, the risk premium which which it doesn't uh, and so the uh, you know so everything we do in terms of um, our economy and the reason why we'll never make it green or sustainable or, or anything like that is is um, is that uh, the the risk cannot be accounted for because you know the, the risks are not uniform risks are, are by definition random so in other words every single insurance company is just waiting for an event that's bigger than the insurance company and it, it comes on a log log scale so this insurance by its nature is impossible, just like uh, having a casino and you know, having it viable forever is impossible. Every casino is, is gonna be wiped out at some point by a lucky gambler. And so every insurance industry is gonna be wiped out by an adverse event. So the, the entire economy is actually a big fraud and it's temporary. It's based on, uh, based on kind of a shell game. It, it's, you know, everybody looks at, at all these things like the continuity of the stock market and how the Dow is going up and the Nasdaq's going up, and they, yeah, they, if you actually go and have a look at the Dow, if you if you go back to the very first co companies that were part of the Dow, the only reason why the Dow has gone up is those first companies were circulated out. So then, in other words, they keep on changing the makeup of the Dow and the Nasdaq and the FTSE and the Russell <laughs> and all these kind of things. They keep on swapping out all the players, so it's kind of like you're not. You, imagine if you go on a to a race course and you bet on a clump of horses, but then you keep on changing which horses you're betting on, <laughs> and then saying, you know, look at my bet, I'm I'm still coming first. You say no. If you look at your original bet, all those horses died on the side of the track long ago. So 
all companies have a, 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 a kind of a life uh, cycle and then they die. You know, all the companies, if you go and have a look at all the companies that were around in 1800 in the US, they're all gone now. And so, but you see, but you say, but the stock market's still roaring. And so I say, only because they changed horses and made it appear that, you know, it was still paying off. But unless they, they do that little shell game of, of changing all the, the players, uh, they, you, you see, if you actually went and did a, a fair bet where you, you put some money on some companies and then just rode them forever, uh, your investment would eventually be worth zero. Now, they hide that from you and they say, no, no, if you invested $10 back in 1800, now you'd be Bill Gates. Only if you knew how to change the horses <laughs> in exactly the way they did it on the Dow. So it's all a it's all a big uh, a big fraud that's based on um, a risk premium miscalculation. Um, it's, I think uh, probably it was Ryan made a point a couple of weeks ago about. Uh, I think you were talking about uh, uh, superannuation and. Uh, um, you know how somebody's uh, fund could decrease in value by fifty percent, and then they say, "But oh, uh, it's recovered uh, that amount." Uh, but as he pointed out, if you had a hundred dollars and it was reduced by fifty percent, and then you ended up with fifty, and then it increased back to the former level, you would only have seventy-five. You wouldn't have your hundred again. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask was. Um, Let's see, what people are trying to do is calculate everything so that it works out for them. And, uh, uh, you know, should we be going for a totally different mode of operation? Um, and uh, that's where I was sort of thinking again about how everything seems to be so relative and floating around and not fixed and uh, confusing. Go on, no, sorry, no, did you want to interject? No. Yeah, the best thing of all is for is for it to be. We should all be like these um, oligarchs are switching horses. So, mm. in other words, if you wanted to make an economy that really worked, you you just uh, make a dollar expire. What's what's wrong with a dollar? Is it's always stays a dollar or pretends to, apart from them uh, slowly debasing it, which is their trick. But but. <laughs> You see, if you had a dollar that say, if imagine all dollars lasted a day, right? If they have a, had a shelf life, uh, you wouldn't have no inequality because Bill Gates or somebody like that, he couldn't accumulate any dollars any faster than anybody else. At the end of the day, that would all be nullified. And so, if you if you say, well, how would that work? Say, so, well, that's how we're supposed to live. As hunter gatherers, in effect, have a have an economy that with dollars that expire within a day. The reason why the Piraha and stuff don't hoard food or get rich or get um, you know socially equal and equal. Yeah, I mean hunter gatherers are not all equal. They're egalitarian because they can't accumulate any wealth. There's strong prohibitions or against wealth accumulation. What they've done with the dollar is done this fraud to say like, ah, you know, everything else is perishable. Everything else is a fish that you know, go rotten in a day. It's a cabbage that goes off in a week. And you, everything, you can't really hoard anything out of nature. And so, but by the time you get to metals, and then by the time you get to the pure fiction of digital currency, you have this fraud that says, oh no, it's gonna last forever. I've got this Bitcoin and it's gonna last forever. And it's like, it's like, come on, man, this is a fraud. If if you made it disappear in a day, you'd, you'd have a much fairer cur currency. Or you, you'd have a much fairer economy. Um, you'd have a much, a much fairer. But, but, but I hope the point is not lost here because the whole economy, you know, what I was saying about hedging against the risk pre premium is this is where we've got to. Is all the guys who have all the money uh, a third of that money, there, there was nine trillion or something that was pumped into the economy um, for COVID, and a, a third of that went to all these uh, all these bastards, uh, you know, Zuck and Elon Musk and S uh, Soros and all all of these guys who are already stuffed to the gills with money. A third of that trillion, three trillion dollars, went to I think it was like sixty guys. 
And you say, well, what, what, it, how does that money go? And it was really because they hedge funds, right? So they they really hedged the the risk. So they they're doing insurance against those those assets. That's how the hedge funds, you know, State Street, Vanguard, and BlackRock, and the, the those guys now own everything. They have everything on the board. And the reason is that they were, uh, you know making this fake, fake insurance company in effect on all the assets. So the assets floated up and down and were random. But, you know, they they took all the money as a, a premium uh, and pretended that there was no randomness. And so, that, you know, every, anybody since Bernanke has been trying to smooth out the uh, the economy and, uh, and so and smooth out growth. And you say, well, you can do that. That's exactly what Bernie Madoff did. They, they all do. It's... It's strange they prosecuted Bernie Madoff because they're prosecuting him for doing a Ponzi scheme and they're doing exactly the same thing. I feel sorry for Bernie Madoff in a way. I mean, although he's a psychopath like all of these other guys, his his only crime was that uh, you know basically the bell rang and uh, you know and the musical chairs and he was left uh, without a seat. But the but uh, everybody Bernanke is doing exactly the same thing as as Madoff. Madoff just tried to please the market. He, he was just trying to serve the money. He was a good citizen in the financial world. And the market said, what we want is smooth, steady, predictable uh, income. We just want a slow growth that's very predictable. And so he gave it to them. It's just unfortunate that the way he gave it to them was, was a Ponzi scheme. But that's exactly what we're doing in, in, on all scales, on the monetary on the fiscal thing on the stock market on the housing market on the whole global market it's all a madoff style ponzi scheme based on smoothing risk right smoothing risk so the guys will not accept any risk they they will not accept that that fish goes stale otherwise we're in the piraha territory can i go back a little bit so where you were talking about hypocrisy um uh, because we're also talking about financial things. And uh, you've mentioned before about the primate, um, the primate uh, fixation on repaying a favour, you know, a sense of justice in that. And uh, I'm just wondering, is there a con do you see a conflict between uh, a hypocritical behaviour and sort of violating that sense of justice that, that seems to come with the primate uh, mentality yeah we, we we've this is also what it says we we got to this dangerous little stage where if you see a primate just is going by instinct an instinct is good they have a strong uh, idea of social debt uh, and and a strong prohibition so the very german thing of you know kind of punishing debtors and stuff by the way, that's the basis of the slave system. Slavery was based on debt, and you got to be a slave, not because white people came into Africa and stole you and took you to a plantation in Jamaica. It's because Africans, black people, sold their brothers willingly, and th they did it as a as they were smug. They sold their brothers into slavery, not because of the white put man. Up the because because yeah. they, they were smug as shit because they were saying like you didn't pay your debts you they were scapegoating guys that went so they scapegoated their brothers and now they come today and say like oh it was the white yeah. man's debt no it was you scapegoating your brothers because you had this false sense of debt now that false um, sense of debt is is yeah. this kind of monkey brain layer that's kind of instinctive yeah. and not not very um, not it's not very uh, self aware. Now we have the alien cortex, and now we're in deep trouble because we've got enough smarts to manipulate that sense of debt. So the bankers are a little bit smarter than the rest of us, and they using our sense of debt. They don't have it. No, no banker ever paid paid their debts. Like Donald Trump's never paid their debt. If you if you want to look at a master of monetary creation, have a look at Hearst. He never paid a debt because he realized that basically, yeah. It, a debt, a debt slave is a debt slave. He's not going to be a debt slave. They, they, they never pay their debts. Rich people never, never, never pay. So what it means is they're not monkey. They're using all of us and our monkey brain. And everybody goes along. They go, oh, you know, he's a debtor. He's a horrible person. He's a sinner. It's like the, the Lord's Prayer used to say, give us, uh, forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And then there's like, oh, no, that didn't work. As soon as they had the alien cortex on the top, they changed it. They changed the fucking Bible. The, the whole rules, the whole constitution, the absolute word of God, guess what? They changed it. Subtly changed. Now, when you go, when you, you know, what I was taught in school was forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. It's like, you bastards. <laughs> you fucking bastards. But anyway, yeah. the the whole the whole idea is that it's um, um, it's a, a debt based system, and now we're in trouble because we've got a little bit smarter than monkey, and we're not actually at the point we we just have a large number of people that are smart enough to abuse our monkey brains and use it, right? All these kind of Shylocks and the Merchant of Venice, and we just haven't got to the other thing where you can actually transcend that. So, so we're in this dangerous transition period between, you know, um, evil Machiavellian monkey and uh, wise, wise person. So you're not, not wrong about rich people not paying their debts. In, in um, high net worth circles, it's called uh, buy, borrow, die, this, this pattern. So you buy an appreciating asset and then you borrow against it to live your, have your daily expenses and then uh, over the course of, of your life, you know, you just keep buying more and more of these things, keep taking more and more debt out. And then when you die, you get a stepped up basis and it passes on to your kids with all the assets pass on to your kids with no taxes ever paid. Um, so you 1031 exchange into more and more properties or things like this where you defer your capital gains on stuff and uh, essentially just keep borrowing. And rich people largely they live off of the borrowed funds um, because instead of paying, you know, 45% tax or whatever they would have to pay if it was income, you have zero taxes on debt. And so you're, you'd much rather pay 3% or whatever on the, the debt repayment than the 45% that you would if it was income. So rich people don't pay their debts on purpose. Yeah, it, it's really funny when Elon Musk. Uh, yeah, it, it was really funny that Elon Musk said the other day is like, you know, hey, you know, I get paid minimum wage. <laughs> All these guys were like, really, you know, it's like, wow, what a cool guy. <laughs> he was like, yeah, he, said, well, he only pays minimum wage because it would be illegal to work for free. That would be fraud. So his well, accountants have of... told him, well, you have to at least get minimum wage. But, but the fact that he gets minimum wage means that he's a scoundrel. And then you say, well, how does he live? How does he afford you know, to run planes and have security details and uh, this amazing lifestyle? And say, well, he gets it all in debt. So really, has it on a credit card? So he's paying 15% interest on his life? No, those guys get See what what the the Fed has moved interest rates effectively to zero, so so a bank will give Elon Musk a a loan at zero percent. Say why? Because they make the money on the fees. They they all scoundrels. They're using the bank asset. The reason why the banks go go bust is because they don't give money to Elon Musk because they hope they're going to get some money back on the interest and it's all a kosher deal. They give him money because they want the fees, the transaction fees, and so the 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 personal employees of the bank make out like bandits. The stockholders of the bank make out like dreadful. And Elon Musk gets his money at 0%. And so who's paying for all this game? Well, the guys that actually generated the productivity that was represented in the dollar. It's you. <laughs> but no, nobody, this is too boring for the average person to listen to. So they just move on. And they never get it. And then slavery is a racist thing for white people did. No, slavery is what you're doing by paying your credit card and supporting the system. Hugh, did well, you put up a, a video on the, the Timbuktu manuscripts or is that something on? Did, you didn't do it? I can't, I'll just uh, state it briefly. I, it might have been something I found. It was a, a, a YouTube video on, uh, on um, Timbuktu pr present day. Uh, where a lot of uh, manuscripts from from um, uh, the, 
you know, when it was a prosperous empire, uh, have been preserved in private hands there. And uh, it was very interesting talk because the fellow was describing um, how there's probably about a million of these manuscripts have survived, and he was talking about what the empire used to be like uh, across West Africa there. Um, and uh, uh, it was interesting because he built into it hints about the slavery system, the, the, the sell the Africans selling the Africans. And it, it was uh, it was interesting to hear that because it wasn't really part of his what he was intending to talk about. It was so intrinsic to the way life was at that time that he, he could not mention it. Um, you know, and so you, uh, uh, you, you it, it gave a very interesting insight into that. Um, I thought it might have been something you put up, but I must have seen it. I'll uh, I'll, I'll post it on on the uh, on the on the on well, XRM. Really cool. It wasn't me, but I, that that's really cool. Yeah. So so the the liberals, so the you know, in liberal academia, in in the kind of circles that say, you know, like um, say things like, "Oh, racism was invented in the 17th century." <laughs> Mm. It was never a concept of race before then. And stuff. It's, like, <coughs> it's nonsense if you go back to uh, to Islam. Islam is fundamentally built on slavery, and nobody likes to talk about that too much. But the, in Islam, they say about the Zanj people, and Zanj people are black people, and bloody hell, are they ever the most racist people you've ever heard in your life? But the, the 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 slave traders in Africa, the primary slave traders to this day are Arabs. All all those slave trading networks and stuff, the the slave trains and stuff, that they, they're all still running. They they're just slightly more elaborate. The guys keep you know, they don't have chains on them. They just keep passports and they just hold the guys' passports and stuff like that. But all those those uh, those things are still running um, to to this day and the. the the reason they call the Zanj people is because that's why Zanzibar is called was called Zanzibar. It's, it's the Zanzibar. It's, it's the the Bay of the Zanj. In other words, the Black People's Bay. But and when they, I they when thought I, of it as a bazaar for slaves. I, I discovered with great surprise when I was I went to see my sister who lived in Essaouira in Morocco years ago, and I was. Um, I was introduced to the music, uh, the Gnawa music over there, and it's a music that's got its roots in Sudan. So I met some of the musicians, and they're all black, and they're descendant of slaves, and nearly all their family names are, uh, they're Muslim first name, but they've got, they, they added Sudanese because they're coming from Sudan. And they, they told me, I mean, they've kept the traditions of their music, the making of their instruments and everything from Sudan, their traditions, even their kind of religious practices, but they're Muslims. But, and I, I discovered, completely uncovered the whole story of the slavery that was happening um, at the time of the expansion of the of, of Islam through North Africa and how the trade, the slave trade, was was the the the, the founding stone of, of the of the Moroccan uh, kingdom and and all those down to Mauritania and and probably Algeria too. But I, I really witnessed. I, I talked to them and I went to visit their families and the the women are they still they still marry a lot between them. So the women really look African. <laughs> they really you know still really black and the, it, that goes back to the year. They told me eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand. So that was before, before the slave trade started uh, from the the west. Um, there was that big, uh, big uh, trade going on. It's very interesting. Yeah, the the thing they don't like to, about to talk about in Muslim circles is uh, is the historicity. If you think the the Christians avoid the historicity of Christianity, you should see how studiously Muslims avoid it because. The 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 story we get now that Islam, you know, basically was the story of Muhammad and how he conquered um, all the, you know, from Messina and then goes on uh, Medina and stuff and goes on from there. It's like it was. It's not at all correct. In if the the historians look at it now and say, no, the Arab Empire came first. Then it was uh, some guy called Suman, I think. Uh, he was a big Arab king. And he invented Islam as an afterthought to justify his empire and his kingdom. So he he got one of his ancestors who was just some guy in the desert called, called Muhammad, and he made all these writings about him and made this 
build in this backstory to justify him as a king because he had no credentials. He was just a slave owner. And so the, the essence of Islam is, is seedy as all hell and intricately, um, intricately bound up with slavery. But, you know, you won't, uh, people won't say that. But if, if you want to be politically correct, the very first thing you got to do is start pointing out stuff like the, you know, the subprime loan crisis in 2008 was a slave market crisis. The subprime loans are just, um, it's, it's just a euphemism for loans to black people. And so basically the, the subprime loan collapse was, was the collapse of um, the debt slave market in, in Africans. In African Americans, and so you've got to start there and sh shut up about the historical shit about you know stolen from Africa. <laughs> so like, let's go back to 2008 when there was a black president and how all these slaves are still chained with debt called mortgage-backed securities. It's basically a mortgage-backed security is a bet on, that a black man will actually carry the load and not not stumble. That's what a mortgage-backed security is. So if they call it BlackRock, it's like, oh, that's a Zange name there, BlackRock. Know what he's talking about. Somewhere down the line, there's somebody who's normally of color who actually is producing all the shit. And everybody else, including all the little white people, be tapping on their keyboards and going down to XR and stuff and say, all you little hypocrites are house slaves built on top of the system. You don't produce anything. <laughs> all the black yeah. people produce it, and you're running bets on the back of them. There, there's, uh, a, that, there's a question there of Ryan. He was asking, what are the sources for the king who sponsored Islam? Because I, I didn't get the name either. What, what did you... I can't remember what his name is. I think he was Suleiman or something like that. There's, um, there's, it's hard to find stuff of this because it's so politically incorrect. But there, there was a video um, I saw a while back with this guy saying uh, the historical origins of Islam. I think he took a lot of heat for that video, but he's he he came out and said what no one will say, and that's uh, the the. That the historians are very loath to talk about the subject as the historical origins, but he came out and talked about the forbidden shit. Is this why um, the, uh, the the split in is in Islam, you know, the Shia and the uh, Sunnis, does that originate back there with this kind of artificial creation of uh, of Muhammad? They're supposed to be two descendants of, of Muhammad. Um, but um, so, um, yeah, I'm not really sure about historically where that split happens. You see, the, it's, it's confounded by the fact that Islam just like pops into the, into the mix and not necessarily in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it's probably a bit further north. Um, so um, the, it's probably, you know, um, the Dome of the Rock and stuff like that, are, those those were the first, I think, um, first serious monuments that they had to Islam. But kind of, uh, people think, you know, oh, well, you got Muhammad and then there's this story and then you eventually get to the, the Temple on the Dome of the Rock and stuff. And they say, like, no, they're far more contemporaneous. I think the guy who built the, the Dome on the Rock is the same guy that invented Islam. He just, they, they cooked it up out of whole cloth. Well, what um, about the military victories, though? No, that's what that's what came first. You see, that's the bugger. Is that, is that all these guys had all these military victories? They they accumulated wealth, and then and through conquest, and then and then this guy to, to actually you know justify himself as a king without any credentials is he he filled in his backstory. But the, the Sunni and the Shia thing, Gary, is a is a is a dispute of of, of descendants of Muhammad over over inheritance. Basically, it was basically. I, as I, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know very much about it. I yeah. understood. I understood it as a conflict between the the biological descendants of Muhammad uh, claiming ascendancy over the spiritual descendants. Um, so there was a kind of, um, uh, how can I put it, a, um, 
you know, the, the, there was a kind of an yeah, ideological yeah. lineage. Yeah. And, and, uh, your mum's against the thing. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Mom's against yeah. The household. No, mm. I, I think they're both um, they're both descendants of him. They're both uh, legitimate descendants. They have exactly the same things, the same belief, the same Quran, the same. Pra it's just that it's a split that happened over very shortly after Muhammad died. So there was a branch that became. Yeah, Shia. that's, that's, uh, that's there, how I understand. You know, it. Yeah, about ten percent uh, and ninety percent Shiite, and it's just became like that, and it's just stayed like that because it it sort of identify with some geographical things and some traditions. So there, there's yeah. they, they've just you know it's it's basically the same thing religiously. I'm not from my little knowledge. I I don't see it's it's just well, a, a fracture a fracture basically. Yeah, so, so all of this was irrelevant um, until uh, King Saud, um, and then King Saud um, stoked up this big rivalry. And the reason is just to keep his um, uh, his monarchy together. So, yeah, he 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 just made invented Wahhabism, and uh, and set the it's kind of a divide and conquer strategy. But he he's the one. The only reason why he was able to do it is because of the Bitter Lake Agreement. So um, Roosevelt went and made this agreement that America would protect Saudi Arabia as long as they kept the oil uh, uh, flowing. And so that so that was like the House of Saud was guaranteed by the Bitter Lake Agreement. And then he got internal strife. A lot of the you know uh, fra uh, fractionalism in internally in Saudi Arabia. So he to to get a radical base behind him, he he started funding all these madrasa and these universities from Pakistan to all over the place, and those are the guys that have made radical Islam and all the problems that have come. So it's it's really the CIA <laughs> and Saud, the House of Saud, and then all I mean the Line Eleven and all of that. It's all these guys. It's factionalism between you know Banda and Saud and. I don't know where Bin Laden fits in it, but Bin Laden's from one of well, them. Bin the Laden, uh, the Bin Laden group uh, has a monopoly on all construction projects and mosques in Saudi Arabia. So um, Bin Laden is really tight in, in that. Uh, he was maybe a black sheep of the family, but very, very connected to the Saudi family, uh, the Saudi uh, power base. Yeah, but uh, where, where the Prince Banda is a kind of, I think he's a you know, opposition figure, and then you know this um, Bonesaw character is um, he's he's not as secure as he'd like to be, but yeah, it's it's very opaque what what goes on there, but very important for world events. <laughs> no, nobody nobody gets an insight. Anyway, all the, all these buggers are um, in uh, in with Israel, and they're busy plotting war against Iran. So, so look out for a bright flash sometime round about there. Can I introduce a new topic, or, or do you want to? Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> I, uh, again, did you, was it a video you put up about David Bowie and Black Star? Was it? Yeah, um, yeah, no, Survivor was one. Where, there was, where, uh, I mean, there's many, many things to talk about there, but <clears throat> just to uh, go out on, on something, uh, you know, a bit um, curious sort that occurred to me. Is Duke, uh, yeah, a bit woo, yeah. Oh, just to introduce it for what it's worth. Was partway through that video, uh, the fellow was talking about um, the, uh, the, the the skull of John the Baptist encrusted in its gold um, casing or whatever, and he called this this. Uh, he said it's used as an ephod, uh, which is a a, 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 a as a, a focus for um, communication to the far side or whatever. And uh, the, it, it's just a little sequence in that video where he shows symbols and garments that people are wearing with these, these, uh, these um, uh, I don't know what you would call them, 
um, badges or something like that with symbols on them, which are used as a focus of uh, communication. And, uh, you know, I mean, it might seem a bit far-fetched, but uh, we, we were talking, I think, last week or recently about uh, means of communication between the extinction arty. And uh, given that we've recently done this work on the sigil, I, I was wondering whether we should uh, be developing our own ephod for communication between the the, the extinction arty. That, I mean, I know it sounds far it's, out. but It's funny you, know. you say that because I, I was thinking the same thing. Um, but I, I thought that maybe we should leave it a bit till, you know, uh, I think we might be getting a bit far ahead of the game. I th the way I was thinking was that we, we get the the manifesto out there and the manifesto, and then we try and, uh, you know, get numbers a bit bigger. I think maybe like try to get to a Dunbar's number of people. Um, but uh, I thought we needed more people for that. That kind of thing will put people off a lot. So, the um, yeah, I would like to try some experiments and stuff to see see what happens. But I think we've got to do a bit more mind melding and stuff like that. Did you like the uh, video of the like the Vulcan mind meld or the Borg mind melds? Uh, that it was, I thought that that was. Uh, rather fascinating stuff about, you know, the we've spoken a lot about the split brain experiments, but that was about um, merging brains. And so I've forgotten about that, that those twins in um, in the UK that actually have, they co-joined on the head. And you, you can actually show, show um, say, an object to, to one of them. Yeah, um, when, and, the, and they can see the other one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but again, that just led me back to the same thing. I thought, well, okay, so they were emphasising that the thalamus that was common between the, the, the two brains. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, but what we just create a, a metaphysical thalamus. Um, you know, I mean, I know that sounds easy to say, but, but that's basically what we have to be doing uh, to, to get that kind of communication. Um, yeah, but I think it's all basically sympathetic stuff. So if you get the same egregore, you know exactly what other people are thinking, and that's, mm. that's how you kind of get in tune. Um, yeah, you first first have to do a lot of alignment before you can get that. But I thought it was really fascinating, just from the point of view of the fascinating questions that come out of that. When one of them is um, stunning that. The, the brain, can, you know, it's what it says about the brain and heart can self-organize. So the, the, basically those two twins actually, uh, you know, they weren't vegetables, right? They were functionally functional people, but with the unified brain. Well, well, you know, that says amazing things for plasticity of brain and how the brain is organized and, and so, you know, embryology. The medical name is Janus, actually, isn't it, for them, for that uh, abnormality? Janus, like Janus headed, Janus, Janus headed, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, the I didn't. Uh, I think these are special because they're kind of functional, right? Normally, they don't last. So, yeah, I mean, any, but it's it's amazing that I mean, the the heads look like severely smushed together. So it, it's it's stunning what the brain is actually doing to actually organize itself into a functional brain. It's, and it's, it's an, ex, you can see very clearly what it's hinting is that it's an expansion of an algorithm. So the, so the neurogenesis is an expansion of an algorithm. It's, it's, you know, nothing matches hardwired. And that, that has stunning implications in terms of, you know, the hive mind and the one world order and stuff. I find it kind of fascinating with those truth stream guys because they, 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 you know, they got a lot of things right. I think, um, and but their their whole shtick, I think, is is fascinating because they clearly individualists, and the, the this whole tide of evil, you know, from like Klaus Schwab to the One World Order to every everybody wants to unify, especially the left. Everyone wants to unify. 
and and they're clearly resisting this being merged into the bigger whole you know they, this is individual ego they 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 egotists that don't want to merge into the large pool which is part of self-realization in other words the alien cortex is playing chess to avoid the big merge <laughs> into yeah but here i think what they're doing is is they're they're I think what you've got to do is distinguish between just being another drone and being part of a a universe, if you like. It, it's just not the same thing. They're, I mean, they're in fear of of um, the, this kind of mindless anonymity, I guess. You know, um, wh yes, whereas yes, so what what wh the kind of connection you're talking about is not is not that. It's not. I, I, you know, this conflating the two different things. Yeah, it's well, it's the kind of the worst movies, the later movies of the Matrix, right? Where it's the hive mind and and all of this kind of super organism. So it's 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 in the Great Reset, and all of the, you can clearly see yeah, that the whole of humanity is merging to this big change. In other words, we kind of are. Becoming a super organism and psychologically in every level, that's that's what's happening. And the the strange thing is though, it seems to be there are two versions, you know, but it, we are kind of this Janus headed beast because it's like it's like who's reset? Everybody knows there's gonna be a big reset, there's a big rebirth coming, you're all kind of pregnant with this, you know, these birth pangs. And it's kind of whose birth is it? Is it Klaus Schwab and these techno humanists is, is that the superorganism or is the superorganism you know the mother earth and the tree huggers and everybody else so it's like there clearly are two destinies and we we're clearly going through a massive transformation in and becoming a superorganism of one or the other and so it's like which which one is it but the the I think the transhumanist one is is a false one it's a an alien core that is the alien quarter substitution. So Ray Kurzweil and the singularity and Klaus Schwab's great reset and the one world order and all of, all of these things that they're going for is a substitution of the real transformation. So in other words, it's it's a fake, you know, transition to a regenerative society. All of these things are substitutions of um, the genuine transformation. So in other words, they're trying to scapegoat. Would do a do a, a sacrifice of some you know lesser animal to avoid the change themselves. So it's, they're all kind of dodges. Uh, they're all trying to dodge fundamental change. So in other words, the Klaus Schwab's great reset and stuff is like no, this is the reset where the the alien cortex lives. <laughs> they're like no, there's there's only one way this birth happens. If the alien cortex, the ego, all of that dies. And so they're trying to do this false one and say, no, no, we, we're going to let the alien cortex and the ego into the paradise. And that's what all the thing about this you know, mechanization, it's all this transhumanism, all this augmented Superman. So we, we're turning yeah, but, I mean, into this... Superman, but, but it's like, which Superman? Is it this silicon enhanced one? So it's, in other words, it's the same old bastard with the jetpack, or is it somebody that's genuinely transformed into a butterfly? what's at stake so in a way that the, the those two people on the truth stream media are uh are unwittingly expressing their fear of of, of uh the, the true transformation but um you know they're condemning the the, the Klaus swab style transformation but in fact actually they're supporting it because in, yeah, that, that's uh, it exactly. It's it's the mm. alien cortex is always Janus headed, and so I keep on telling you this is the most unpopular thing. I mean, this might have been a reason why some people left, but I say this over and over again as as late into the video as I can, is the the Aryan is a Janus headed thing. The Aryans are clearly a, a false hybrid. It's you have these Neanderthal characteristics, Cro-Magnon, and so when when you go back to slavery. It's really the alien cord, it's really a Neanderthal in us. Well, a hybrid. Going back to enslave Africans that don't have this other module. And so it's so the 
what I'm saying is if you have a look at the, the Jews and the Nazis, they're the same thing. If you look at the, the whole reason why we have this such suppression against Nazism and stuff, and, um, and the same kind of mirror image in Zionism and, you know, all these, these uh, the wokeism is deep bedded in, in all of this stuff. And it's, it's the self, you know, that's the, um, the thing, you know, the, the old trope of the self-loathing Jew. It's not a self-loathing Jew. It's a self-loathing alien cortex. It's just the, the Jews are hexos, right? They're Canaanites. They, see, if, in history, they just pop up in, out of nowhere in ancient Egypt. But if you look at the genetics and follow through Semitic languages and where they must have come from, you can see they're the hexos. They went as, as conquerors to Egypt and conquered all of these guys. There must have been a revolution because they, you know, kick off in the Bible as slaves. <laughs> it's like, well, there must have been a little overthrow over there because they, they clearly came down with chariots and horses. They're Aryans. And they, so, so, you know, the reason why that you get this such thing about, you know, this whole storm about Nazis and Jews and stuff is it's the alien cortex. And, and you can see it over and over again. It's like the black, white, the red. Those those colors are fundamental to, to Aryans. And everything's suppressed. You're not allowed to say it. You're not allowed to talk about the swastika. You're not allowed to look at the things. You have to say that Nazis had no ideology. You have to say, oh, they were not national uh, socialists. They're not socialists. Only socialists in name. It's like, guys, it's the same Janus-headed beast. This This is... Our problem until somebody comes out and says it, it's that it's you know, you won't get anywhere. But man, you get the alien court, you, you just called the beast by its name when you say that Jews and Nazis are the same. I think, I think you, you hinted at something similar when you commented on the video of Paul Kingsnorth and, and Thar and Charles Eisenstein because. At one stage, you said, uh, if my memory is good, that you preferred a Klaus Schwab that was openly, um, you know, doing the AC thing than uh, the attitude of Paul Kingsnorth, who was actually, uh, by a kind of a twist, actually going the same way, but it was presented, you know, I, I can't remember your words exactly, but uh, do you want to comment on that? Because I think it was in the comments yeah, uh, Gary yeah. wanted to hint at that. Yeah, I did actually. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Um, uh, I guess I'll start yeah. off. Hugh, you made a little comment. That you, put, you made a long comment there on, under that video, and uh, it began with saying that, you know, that Klaus Schwab was, uh, uh, you know, he, 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 he was well-intentioned but severely mistaken uh, and at least honest, whereas Kings North was being, you know, dishonest uh, and that, that you would prefer swab any day um, and I just uh, <laughs> um, what happened there when I read that uh, I thought to myself you know if you had removed the word swab and Kings North from that paragraph and said to me put those words in in the right place I would have I would have put them in the opposite place um, uh, and so it was. Uh, uh, can you can you explain? Uh, as I yeah. I looked at, I looked, Schwab must understand that he is promulgating a tech a techno um, authoritarian dystopia. Um, that, that you know he he must realize where that ends up. Um, and no, on no, the other side. No, no, he doesn't. You see, the, the, the reason why I but said that it is, would make him a complete idiot. It, yeah, he is a complete, what that's what I'm saying. He's a complete idiot. Yeah, I mean, I mean they, yeah. they put out the, all their plans about the Great Reset, and he said, you know, uh, I mean, if you look at his book where, where he says, you know, you will know, own nothing and you will be happy and stuff, you realize that he's got this infantile good heart <laughs> with an alien cortex riding on top. So, so I mean, the, I put Kings North and, and Schwab in that category because Schwab clearly has a good heart. I mean, he's pure evil. He's blowfelt. But that's because it's the alien cortex. Underneath uh, his alien cortex, he has a pure heart. The problem with King, Kings North is he doesn't have a pure heart. 
He's a he's a conniving liar. He he will settle for Christmas. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted. Can, can you just go in specific? Yeah, where's the lie? Just can you just zoom in on that? Because he's, he's, the way I interpret him is the dark mountain stuff and all of that kind of stuff. It's painful. He's starting to see his own death, right? And so he's doing the traditional cheat that that uh, keeps everybody enslaved. It's the Christian cheat that says like Christ died for our sins. So in other words, he's substituting his own, uh, he's substituting this fake thing, Christ and stuff, for his own transformation. So it's it's the double dealing of the alien cortex. You see, he's not. See what's so evil about Christianity is a couple of things. A, it's basically saying you know like you know, you're nothing, there's God, and there's Jesus dies for your sins. So in other words, you you don't really have to do anything other than just believe this bullshit story. But the, but you see, the, the essence of Christianity is you don't really have to change, right? So, you, so they have a, a, a baptism and a rebirth and stuff, and it's all shallow. It's all a substitute for, see, that's the overall thing that you see again and again in Christian, in Christians. It is they've done a fake transformation. So they've they've done an artificial transformation. They've done a baptism. They've done, uh, you know, I've been reborn again in Christ. What does that mean? You're still a stupid cunt as you always were. It's like there's been no change. It's been superficial as all fuck. And why but is it you do dark mountain? You get all the pain of that thing. Oh, I'm I'm going to be dissolved and die and stuff and all this pain. And then you go, oh, wait, I got a way out. I'll go for Christianity, then I can do the switcheroo where Christ dies for me. Hula hula hula. And ooh, I get off without transforming. It's evil. But I'm not. I'm not. This is, and that's I, why I put Klaus Schwab. <clears throat> here. Like Klaus Schwab mm. could transform. I mean, he's too stupid to transform. But you know, Klaus Schwab yeah, is never going to be enlightened. But so, it, but I mean, he's he's he's, he's just an idiot. But but I'm, Kings North has self awareness. So what he's doing is fucking evil. I I'm just wondering. You, I, I think the the you you might be wrong on two counts there. I think he may not be an idiot, and he he may not be a good person either. So there's a lot of PR and folks uh, like supporting the the image of these these billionaire people. Um, and you look at people like Warren Buffett, and um, they're they're absolutely intolerable people, even though they have this very positive image. Um, um, and the um, so, for for example, Warren Buffett, he's always saying, "Oh, we don't want to." Uh, I I pay a, a a lower tax rate than my assistant does, and this kind of thing. And uh, so we should pay. I think we should all pay more taxes up here at this rich tax bracket, and. Uh, the truth is, is that he he wants the the government to, to raise the taxes on on the people in the, the this bracket because he's already made his wealth and he he's locked in the capital. Uh, he, he doesn't need to to pay taxes at all because he he has uh, the he doesn't sell stocks. Right. So um, he, if he's already locked in the rates, um, then then he's essentially just kicking the ladder down from below him so no one else can come and threaten his his position it, there there are there are so many when you're dealing with these these sociopaths they have uh always a two two-pronged approach they have the real reason and the the good reason that everybody's supposed to believe in and and i i think you're giving too much credit to klaus schwab and and folks like that when you or, or not not enough credit by thinking that their good reason is genuine. I think they're liars. Uh, yeah, no, you may be right. But you see, the thing that I see over and over again with these types, and bear in mind that I grew up with them, that, that they're just conservatives. Their only crime is conservatives. So you have to, you have to hang out with them for quite a long while before you see how fucking reptile, reptiloid evil it really is. So the, uh, and what I mean by that is if, if you go and if you were ever, 
introduced to the queen and you hang out with the royalty and you know all the glitter and the silverware and all the pomp and ceremony and stuff and you you went around their range rover on their farm and just talked to them they'd seem like the nicest people you ever met and so you say well where does it start to go wrong and so you start to see slowly that they think they're on a different a different cast and they are they, they we, we put them there. and so they but I uh, say, so ultimately, where does the evil come in? And the evil comes in pretty much like a, with a farmer. It, uh, it's always, they always look like farmers to me. Uh, they think of themselves as farmers. In fact, the queen and, and Philip, before he died, was they, they call themselves farmers. The queen calls her, her mafioso the, the firm. The firm. It's, it's French, le ferme. It's the farm. It's basically... They think of themselves as farmers and as sheep. That's it's it's the noblesse oblige. It's the you know white man's burden. We had this in South Africa, so we weren't we weren't fundamentally evil, uh, in the, in that kind of conniving way that I'm kind of trying trying to tar Kingsworth with, with that devious kind of snaky thing. It's just a a kind of a self righteous absolutism where you just think, well, I'm. A better class than everybody else. I'm rich, and I don't want to give it up. I don't have to give it up. And and why would anybody? You know, everything in Downton Abbey is lovely. You know, I'm 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 very caring about all my staff. I look after them. They have a good retirement. I you know castrate the bulls and you know let the ewes run. And you know it's all managed rather well. So it's all. It's all this kind of management and farming and superficially it looks wonderful. Go around, go around Balmoral or Windsor Castle or any one of their farms or estates. And you'll see they're lovely. They're oak trees and it's manicured and it's all fine. And you're just like, where does it get evil? Is when you start to really get into the meat and potatoes of see what they have to do to maintain that and what they will do to maintain that. So in other words, it all looks fucking ace when you're talking about Downton Abbey and it's on the PBS and Americans are all going, ooh, and ah, and we wish we had a royal family. And say, like, here's the cost. D-Day. When you're on fucking Omaha Beach and there's some German guy who wants to go home to his girlfriend and he's fucking shooting tracer bullets at you and you have to have your balls shut off. Why are you doing this? For them, for Balmoral. That's where the evil starts. And so it's like when you push these buggers, when you see what they will do to hang on to Balmoral, then you will see evil. You will see pure, unadulterated, fucking raw evil. So Hitler wasn't all that bad compared to where these people will get to when you push them, right? So that's... People, you see, you have to hang out enough and know what this farmer will do to hang on to the farm and hang on to his status is absolutely anything. No holds bar. And that's can, can we just, do you mind if we just go back just for a moment to, to Kings North? Because, um, you, you know, you, you've, you said you think of these devious and snaky. Now, we, we've granted Schwab's obli obliviousness to the outcomes of his agenda. Um, so why don't you... No, no, he's fully uh, vested. He, he wants... His agenda means he stays on top and all everybody, all the animals on the farm are happy. That's his objective. Yeah, but what he's not seeing is that, is that it's creating a dystopic world. Um, he's, that, that's the part that he's not getting, that he's creating a hell on earth. Um, by, by, by the way, in, I think he yeah. hinted in his last email that he, di he didn't want the meeting to be recorded. But I think I'll try to coax yeah. him to. to I'll try to coax That's him. To... That's what I'm talking about. You see, chess, yes. playing yeah. chess, cunning, evil. He's, he's strategizing. He's nice. And this is not pure of heart. That's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. I know. No, no hang on. I, I just can I just get, uh, can we just get one thing out of the way, which is that that. Uh, Schwab has got his blind spot in not seeing what the human consequences of his agenda is. Um, and Kingsnorth has got his blind spot in not seeing that um, his, his religious substitution is an evasion of his spiritual responsibility. So I'm in, in a way... Wait, 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 stop. Wrong on both counts. So, okay. Oh, so okay. Well, that's it. Schwab... Yeah, 
there's no he he, uh, he doesn't see the 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 consequences as bad because they are not bad for him right he doesn't see that there's negative consequences oh, for him for him because it's not a dystopia but but yes. he doesn't believe it's a dystopia for you either yeah, but that's see, that's what I'm see, saying. This is this is the blind if spot. Just, if you just obey and go <laughs> along with what he is, then everything in the garden is lovely. It's is you that are causing the problem because you won't go ahead with the program. To to actually get to his utopia, there's no amount of evil that he'll do to rub you out. See, it's see that's what's the problem with communism and totalitarianism and the left. It's like they're not evil; they're trying to get to a good place. <clears throat> because they're consequentialists, there's nothing they won't do to get to the good place. <clears throat> the better the good place is, the more evil they'll do to get there. That's exactly what happened in Soviet Russia. It's basically, they're all going on this journey to this wonderful, utopian, fair, fabulous paradise. Now they are these fucking jab refuse nicks and shit like that that just won't come along with the program so what are we going to do snuff them out do anything i mean there's nothing that won't justify getting to paradise so snuff these fuckers out now there's no nothing wrong he doesn't there's not blind spots or anything he's got it absolutely right it's clear vision now but the isn't king's north is, also trying to get to a paradise as well it's the same he's, he's got trying the to same cheat agenda his way to paradise He's trying to play chess into a paradox. You see, what Kings North is trying to do is fundamental transformation. So he's, he's fundamentally trying to avoid transformation. Why? Because he's scared of death. See, you see, if you're vested in your ego, this transformation requires the death of the ego. You don't exist in a very real sense. It's not abstract. It's... It's not um, some kind of analogy. It's like it's a, it's an analogy when you do it in the Christian way. That's why it's a copper. But if you really, really, really transform, you don't exist anymore. You're dead. You're a dead person. I mean, on the other side of the looking glass, you completely redefine everything. But on the side of the looking glass that you are pre-transformation, in the language of that, Everybody on the other side of the looking glass is a ghost. They're dead. Isn't it still the same process that Schwab's engaged in, where he's going to transform the world rather than do the transformation that really needs to be done? Is, isn't it still yeah, a parallel between? Yes. This, yes. this so is my basic both, point, is that you've, you've, yeah. You've, yeah. you've juxtaposed Kings, North and Schwab, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't see them as being very much different when it comes down. No, they're not. They're not. They're both, they're both you see, I'm just saying one's an alien cortex with a pure heart, or in mm. other words, not an evil heart, and, and one's an alien cortex that's, that, that has no heart. They're just playing chess. Mm. Yeah. You see, there's a difference. You see, we, we, we kind of grant people the, the benefit of the doubt in terms of love and heart and feelings. And just because somebody has feelings and stuff, then you say, well, he's a nice guy and he loves his kids. And I think that's a really harsh thing to say. And you say, like, you look a little bit deeper. It's basically it's self-preservation. Like there's this chess playing game all the time going on. So it's like, the, so a lot of this love is sentimental. It's it's self-serving. It's limited. It's not really love. If any, that's, that's why it's better not to talk about these things like love. If you if you talk about love or anything, you hang on your sleeve. That's a red flag right there. It's like it's again. It's in Cordelia, right? Cordelia and Kinglia. So love doesn't speak its name. So if anybody so, is speaking its name, you say, well, "Who's this fraud?" What I'm questioning is, is there any going to be any point in talking to King's North in the first place? Because it, 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 you, uh, it doesn't look as though you're going to get into a point of understanding about what you're saying any more than you would get Clara Swab to an understanding if, you, if we were interviewing him instead. I'm not, I'm not intending it, to get him anywhere. I'm intending to, to, to let you guys see. <laughs> you see, well, the, the great part I, yeah, about this yeah. is, is, is if you expose the snake, it's good for everybody. It's a kind of exorcism, right? Mm. You want a you demon. I... I mean, it's no point in to exercising mm. someone that isn't a demon. Do you think it's I should about... try to? I should try to change his mind and ask him if he would be recorded, so that 
um, a bigger audience could hear him or sh or should I yeah. could, could I tell him yeah. that we just record it for ourselves we won't post it on YouTube or I don't know what you know we could just no 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 just just say we no no say we want to publish it but uh, just say that like we have people all over the world and not everybody can make it so the way we do these yeah. things is to you know basically just have a few people on the call and then we can share it all with everybody but just tell them we have a tiny membership it's not yeah. you, you, you're not going to get exposed on joe rogan here but um there's is there really as as gary is saying is there really a point in um in asking him because sure. Sure, i'm trying the whole, to, the whole I'm trying thing to imagine we're doing. what it's going to be like i just <laughs> no, but I mean, Hugh, you, you've said it. You've said as much now as we're likely to get out of talking to him anyway. So I guess I, I suppose that's what Sophie means. What's the point at this stage? No, no, no. Um, I'm saying that he won't get in. I'm not going to transform him. I'm going to transform you. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you have, in a sense, by just saying what you've been saying for the last few minutes. I, no, I think all that's no, going to happen by having. But you see, I might be completely wrong. You, he might, either way, he might turn turn around and completely surprise me. So it's either way, it's good. <laughs> I, I've got to admit that that I, I uh, wouldn't have the faintest idea how to contribute to the conversation. I'd probably just be sitting there listening. Well, well, I uh, think a good, a good start, Gary, would be to to read his three essays on the on I, the. I on have. The you have i think and he's the, I, I, yeah that's not i really I'm enjoy yeah, i enjoy his good. his writing is amazing I, I i love it but he's just appalling when he talks it's just awful but you know at, at the level at which he's writing uh uh you know he's really very he's really very uh very engaging um he does this, does, is, this is all the illuminated manuscripts like darren so all these these oh, well, guys yeah, are yeah, illuminated yeah, manuscript. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, mm. It's all the sweet yeah. talk and stuff. But you see, underneath all of this stuff is anger. There's there's anger, anger, anger going through. And so you see this uh, suppressed. And that that other the other guy or whatever his name is, uh, the Jewish guy. Oh my God, he's a class A demon. But you see, under all that syrupy stuff is a lot of anger. A lot of anger. If if you can draw out that anger, then then uh, everybody he and everybody else can see it. You only have to do it once, right? And especially if you have these false gurus. These you see, there's the idea is not to get a nice interview or something like this. The bigger things at stake here. This uh, people are these people are all gurus, right? They they you know they. they they're not they don't just happen to come on YouTube and stuff by accident. There's an agenda, right? Everybody's got an agenda. And so the like the agenda is to lead people. And so so you know, these are thought leaders, these are influencers and stuff like that. That's why he's very cautious about being on a video. Because he doesn't want to lose his flock. But uh, you know, these are vampires, man. These are vampires. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. There isn't anybody that can't transform. You see, that this is the, the the whole point is the transformation of of the demon. So it's the the transformation of the demon into a godhead in a way, kind of like a bit. So um, it, in a way, with King's North, it's instructive that he seems to have woken up to how the society we live in works very very late um uh and uh similarly he's probably going to be a very late comer to waking up to what his what his uh real awakening has to be so in other words he's just he's just behind he's, he's just a long way behind is, is that a fair yeah, thing this, to say? This is, so the church is macchio right so if, if you get in that, it's, it's basically, you know, if you're on the Titanic and you realize the Titanic's going down and you go and find a nice, cozy little Christian cabin with all these nice glittery objects and stuff and you just sit there and think, okay, well, 
I, I don't care whether the Titanic goes down now. I'm just going to go down in my little Christian paradise. And so, like, why would you ever come out of that room? Unless somebody went in there and kicked the door in. And said, the fucking ship's going down, Kings North. Stop this Christian hiding hidey hole shit. Um, but can, I, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't understand why why there's so much strong feeling about these guys. I mean, one of the things I'm sort of fascinated by, I mean, Eisenstein in particular, is the way that I kind of like what they're saying some of the time. Like Gary was saying, their written stuff is quite good. and But I my response to them is this feeling of quite liking what they're saying and wanting to punch them in the throat every time I encounter them at the same time. And for me, it's this kind of um, conflicting feeling of like, oh, yeah, it's quite good. I mean, like I like reading Eisenstein's perspective on like modern medicine, which is basically slating modern medicine. And it reflects a lot of ideas that I, I think and, and it explains stuff that seems quite coherent to me. And again, I, I feel an anger and hatred towards the guy at the same exact moment that I'm enjoying what he's writing. Um, um, but I don't I don't really feel like, oh, I don't really give that much of a toss about uh, King's North or Eisenstein or any of those. As in uh, Hughes' reaction, for instance, you, you seem like really like, oh, these guys, uh, you know, they're evil embodied and all of this. And I don't quite see that. I see them as, as Warleys. Uh, some of the time, or, or as, as I say, I have this kind of visceral reaction some of the time, but I don't think they really matter to any of this. I mean, like, no one listens to them, really. I know they've got their followings and everything, but they're very minority figures in the greater scheme of things, no? But anyway, I'm just, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out what I think about all this stuff. Um, but, but yeah, why such a strong reaction? Why is King, who gives a shit about Paul King's North but, at the end of the day? Because because they are a very rare commodity. They have self-awareness. So they, not everybody has the ability for self-transformation. So uh, the, the, why I get so animated is, is they, they have the ability and they have the, the strength and they have the intellectual. How are you spotting that? How could, they, they, how, they're, not, they're not rising to the challenge. Yeah. How, how can you, why, why are you sure of that? Because of the, all the polished manuscripts, if you if you you see most people don't give a shit about anything. If, but if you if you enlightened enough to write an illuminated manuscript, then you're worth uh -huh. caring about to put back on the path. Mm. I mean, most people are watching fucking soccer. <laughs> They're like, yeah. they, they, you know, they don't have an independent thought in their mind. They're just they're just mouthing the last. They're, they're barely there. And so it's like that's that's right. the norm, and then you get these guys that are thoughtful, that have, they're receptive, they're wired into the pain, they can do something like Dark Mountain, and then they run and hide in the fucking jeweled Christian cave. Oh, right. okay. like, oh okay. my God, what a fucking waste! And and don't yeah. forget, uh, Bob, because I know I'm I'm the same with Charles Eisenstein. I discovered him years back, and I thought, oh great, I read The Ascent of uh, Humanity. It was a big big thing. But it, it, a bit like what we talk about, really, basically. But and I, I, at the same time, I've got this funny mixed feelings about him, too, and get annoyed. But what really got me is when he started talking to Jem Bendel. <laughs> Should I say the name? <laughs> That's a trigger that word. Was... That's it. Now we're going to get a strike on YouTube. <laughs> but, yeah, when he... Uh, he, start, he, he got a bit involved with the people from Deep Adaptation, and then I started to distance myself from from his um, his works and his conversations. He wrote a good thing called um, the Coronation at the beginning of the coronavirus, but it was also um, yeah I, he had gone a he gone a funny way. So I, I'm the same as you, Bob. I, I think the guy is is really really uh, enlightened in a way, and on the other hand. Uh, you want to strangle him sometimes. Uh, absolutely. You know. Mm. So let me put my cards on the table and tell you my limitations. So my limitations are um, you know, that I definitely want people to survive. What's coming is going to be very, very difficult to survive. 
And so to, to basically navigate this and to, to actually for anybody to get through this is going to be a feat of ages. So I'm, I'm not a big on me surviving. I mean, I, I, I've had a good life already. And if I pop my clogs tomorrow, it, I wouldn't shed a tear. I'd be amazed at the life I've had. But it, it, my limit is, you know, my personal limit is, I, my dog in the game is, is people have got to live through this. We, we had a very, very critical juncture. This is not, you know, personal dingy dangies in the, you know, jerk off on it with a pen and on a keyboard and you know in, in the end times this we, we're gonna have to be sharp as nails to get the, through this and so i my limit is that i fucking want our species to survive it's not going to do this you see there's there's implicit selfishness and egotism in both of these characters and so like look you know the, we're on the fucking titanic and if 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 you luring people away into little cupboards somewhere, we don't achieve this transformation. So it's am I, am I audible? Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, but yeah just, like, it, it doesn't even fucking matter what we say or think or do as to whether somebody survives like a flippening or anything like that. I mean, some people, you know, presumably also people from like poor, not a bunch of white middle class people having conversations on the internet. Are probably least likely to survive um but you know uh my favorite model of like uh whatever uh, abused third world people who, who live by the grit of their teeth are more likely to survive some sort of catastrophe um so like, as in you know i don't see paul king's north loving jesus making any difference or yeah so i mean i sort of understand i understand a bit more what why you feel annoyed particularly with those people because okay they they express some sort of understanding and yet choose to be oblivious to key um key things but um yeah i mean really who's gonna like again survive like the reversal of the earth's position in space um it's going to be like some hard-ass motherfuckers who are lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and you know you know realistically only a few thousand human beings if that were the case is enough you know and that's like there's not i don't see how anything that we're going to talk about here is going to make any difference to that is it no you're absolutely right that's why i say it's it's my personal limit that's this is the end of my ignorance is is this you know the the conceit that you know we can actually do something which clearly we can't you, you nailed it but you still got to do something in the meantime <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Okay, right. this is my my personal limit is I, I i can only do so much sailing around and enjoying cocktails and watching sunsets i, I basically i've got to do something in the in you know in the end times yeah sure so it's just it's a personal thing i mean I, there, there's not any right thing to do um it's just I, I can't stand by and do this that game. It, it churns my stomach. And I can't do much of the, you see, the, I, I do worry. It's kind of a, it's kind of the faulty thing is that you, 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 you don't want regrets, right? At the final time it is, it is you, you don't want to despise yourself or, or what you did. So you want to, try your best to do as much as you can even though you're absolutely right we can't actually do anything no. but there, there is there, you see I, I i always like the conceit of of the, you never actually do know what you might do that, that you see in this kind of situation of the flipping the especially the psychological flipping is is it's very much hangs on a feather and so it's you know it's it's basically you don't know what this turns on and it would be really really horrible to know that all it took was a tiny nudge and and maybe you know seven guys on on this call could have done it maybe the you know it's you see what i mean is it's so finely balanced well, that's, that's this, in retrospect right you know that when you're reading the history or, or watching the docudrama later on that some this event hinged on this um, I mean, I was, I was. You see, that's my experience. That's my I, experience. It yeah. always hinges on the tiny, tiny thing that's oh, often written out of history. I really don't know anything about that. I mean, I, I, I was, I was watching like a, some uh, sci-fi dystopian scenario movie the other day, and um, like in a lot of these, there's the sort of underground 
organization that has managed to come up with some way of getting past all this like robot spying shit and then they're hiding in a, a cavern somewhere underground and they're going to resist you know or die the evil um whatever overlords or whatever the the mechanical dystopian sci-fi society thingy and there's so many movies like that whether it's the like the matrix and you know where you've got these sort of underground organizations and uh these people who are very brave they know they're probably going to die and they're blah blah, blah doing all this secret society thing and then at the end you know there's some sort of a fight with the evil um empire whatever and they may or may not win in the movie but uh, i don't know if such a thing exists now in this uh, reality that i'm experiencing i don't know if there's anyone doing something like that where i live or anywhere else in the world when we're actually facing like this catastrophic um scenario and when i watch these movies i'm always like yeah you know the, go the underground and I, and I know something about maybe in world war ii you you hear stories about the french resistance or um you know the partisans my alleged forefathers who went into the forests of czechoslovakia or something like that and fought fought the bosch or whatever blah 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 with a with an old rusty teaspoon whatever heroically um um and you know so but i mean you know obviously you know you wouldn't talk about something like this um anyway if it was going on but i'm i'm talking about in in the movie there's something like that happening yet um yeah i, I don't know i suppose if there was you know we 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 would all be sort of backing something like that in any sort of movie that we were watching wouldn't we yeah so the thing is though all these big events they all hinge on on basically butterfly events so they they it's the butterfly effect and you don't know whether you're the butterfly so uh, i mean the butterfly that makes the biggest effect so you you know we all know we're butterflies and we just don't amount to any more than a bug but you still have to flap your wings because you don't know if you're the one that say so it's kind mm. of like if everybody to taste the thing, say, like, we're all just butterflies. You can just sit here on a rock. And you say, well, then you're absolutely sure that the major effect won't ever happen. So is that a cop out? Is that, is that copping out then just going, oh, I'm a butterfly against many butterflies. So, you know, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's well, that's the truth. You are just yeah. a butterfly against millions of others. But the problem is that that because of sensitive dependence, and you, you don't know if you are the butterfly that makes the battle. You see, all you know is that we're on the field of Armageddon with these huge forces arrayed against each other. But since they're actually equal forces, it's kind of like the you know the Janus headed thing is coming up against itself. So you don't know what the decider is. All you know is that it must be something very, very slight. Maybe so Tim's North is that. You have to flap your wings. You might be it. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, yeah, no, that, be that's North, North, you know. But even yeah, as a fucking yeah, Christian, you know, yeah. maybe the Orthodox Christian. I mean, I don't even know what the Orthodox. I, I think that's like the Russian Church or something, is it that he's joined, or with a funny hat? Well, Bulgarian, I think. Bulgarian. So, okay. Yeah. Which again, I don't know enough about them. Maybe they're all very cool. But um, the yeah, maybe that will be the thing that survives. You know, maybe the the yeah. most flippening whatever bottleneck of humanity. There'll be five thousand human beings who are following Kings North as the Messiah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, but that's it. Exactly. That's why we need diversity. Because, you see, that's one of the things that's wrong with all this unite, unite. We can all do this together. If we all come together, if we all have one world and all this. If we're all communists. And yeah, but that's terribly dangerous because of exactly what you said is I, you know, my instincts are against uh you know, kind of animated by Kings North because, you know, of, of what I see. But you he might be the decider. And so, but you see, you can only, you know, I can't say, well, I'm not going to do anything because maybe he's the, <laughs> it's like, you got to go with what you know is wrong. And so basically you go with that and knowing full well that you you don't have all the cards and this is there's no right and wrong in this game. You're just kidding yourself. So some somebody decides. But the you know it's like uh, you got to put your throw your hat in the ring and fight for for everything you're worth, knowing the fact that it's all a game of diversity and you might be killing the the guy that's going to you know deliver us all. 
speaking of uh, movies about uh, collapse in this, there, there's a, a movie I want to recommend to the group, and that's um, uh, Don't Look Up. It's a, a new film. Oh, no, if we, if we come across oh. it already. So, yes. It's so far, yeah. now, is it not? Yeah. I saw it recently. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> I totally sympathize with the Cassandras crying about the apocalypse, and literally no one can fucking hear them. <laughs> I, I saw the uh, I saw the trailer and I went and looked at uh, the plot on on Wikipedia, but but uh, I didn't see the movie. But yeah, I thought yeah, well that's my life. I don't need to see that movie. That's that's, that's me. <laughs> What's very interesting about that film is how the mainstream media. I mean, if you uh, listen to the 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 idiots at the the sort of Guardian or whatever stupid uh, newspaper you have to look at. Um, they're, um, they're all very dismissive. This is pompous, uh, Hollywood bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And the reaction across all uh, mainstream media seems to have been quite unanimous in that sense. And uh, uh, of literally their response to this film is, don't look up, <laughs> which is, you know, don't fucking look up. No, really, don't look up. <laughs> Irony, well, the irony, and lack of self awareness. But but it's popular, right? It's a popular movie, though. Is the critics are against the audience again. Like it's, one of those. It's, it's on Netflix, which is one of the one of the biggest platform uh, in the West for for movies. So I mean, it must have been seen by an awful lot of people because I watched it twice. I wanted to see all the details, and I, really, it's just I hardly ever watch movies like that. I managed to get, but you, if you know somebody on a boat who's got Netflix, go and see it because I managed to hijack one and you can always find somebody who has it. And it's worth it. It's <laughs> And it's a good laugh. It's very well made. It's very well filmed. Uh, there's plenty of sort of special effects and everything. But the, the comedy is, is just, I mean, it's it's more than goes far beyond a, a comedy, far beyond. The message is clear. Yeah, the movie doesn't really touch on this, but um, it, it's sort of a background thing, but I think it confirms something I've always noticed and is that pop culture like dims your consciousness. That's why, you know, the people really can't process the apocalypse. <laughs> it's because pop culture dims their consciousness. Yeah, you kind of you really have to unplug from the Matrix or at least get one foot out of it. Yeah. Have, has everybody seen Network from the 70s? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen that, that that's very relevant here <laughs> for for that partic- in particular. Um, and especially the ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um. I think that maybe that don't look up uh, hit a little close to the bone. That's why the mainstream didn't like it. Anyway, well, Jesus, this is a long one, isn't it? So maybe we should, we should. <laughs> we've done worse than Joe Rogan here. <laughs> should we end it, or does anybody have anything more to say? Oh yeah, I asked a question about the Cro Magnum uh, Neanderthal hybridization. So what did that exactly do? Like I know about the fox p gene or whatever but what exactly did that do to like the structure of the brain to like create um a potentially neurotic human yeah when when they look at um well it did a number of things one of them is it turned white people white (laughs) now the um geneticists don't like like that and so they've come out with this bullshit that says oh yeah neanderthals were pale skin and had red hair but there were different genes that gave us that horseshit it's like they it's in essence i think the signature gene is an ar1 gene so uh so the um that that gene you can see it spreading but when they look at the effects uh they mainly um neural they're mainly on the brain and and particularly in the frontal cortex so so it's essentially it's given us this um my according to my theory anyway it's given it's given us this kind of self-awareness because it's kind of a a, a kind of a this janus headed thing that's not comfortable with itself it's kind of like 
a failed hybrid in a way, certainly psychologically, I mean, it's, it's made the divided brain. I think it's now the very, very unpopular, hard to find research, but you can find it. There are occasionally pu papers published in Nature and stuff, but very hard to get funding for anything of this for obvious reasons is the difference in race. So if you know, Sub-Saharan Africans, if you have a look at the difference between what, what the genes that Neanderthals gave Europeans and people like me, is they mainly mental and they're mainly on the frontal cortex. So, so uh, um, Sub-Saharan Africans have a lot more sciatic area, basically this area where it's controlled sight and things like that. Um, and they don't have the thing that um, Miguel Christ often talks about, which is the um, the uh, hemispherical twist in the thing that basically the uh, particularly the left side is, is bigger but if you have a look at the kind of trays of neanderthals they they quite antisocial they were probably cannibals um they um they hoarders collectors they, they would come together to like bring down a mammoth and things like that but um uh they probably have more language ability and uh, although anthropologists hate this idea because we're still very very prejudiced against neanderthals um uh, they hate the idea that neanderthals will start doing art so the this hybrid is starting to do art and in a way it's you know one side of the brain talking to the other side it's it's a, a really a mental illness art and if you look at rank and look at the the problem of the artist you can see him wrestling here without knowing the genetics or the background of what he's looking at but the you know you don't sub-saharan africa you don't get a van gogh if you look at van gogh you see all the all the things kind of distilled you see this you know red hair this self-annihilation this you know all you, you look at van gogh's life and you see oh yeah well that's you can see the all the characteristics of the neanderthal and the cro magnum so the cro magnums i think are very goal oriented it's like in Africa, we hunted to exhaustion. That's a hunting technique where you just like wound an animal and track it. So to track something, you've got to read, you've got to think very linearly. You have to hold a goal for about three days. You have to track something you've wounded. So it needs incredible focus. You can never, I can't imagine a Neanderthal doing anything close to that. But so uh, they need to be resolute uh, and and very social, um, Cro-Magnum, Sub-Saharan African. Now the Neanderthals are the engineers. The, it's, if if you look at going to the moon, you know, and, and a stupid madcap idiocy like going to the moon, the way I interpret it is, you can see the uh, the Cro Magnums. They have more melanin. They, you can often see this in a, in the workplace. It was very very obvious in software engineering. You get these guys who have tans, a lot of melanin. You have a look at the effects of melanin. You can see the the, uh, the difference between Cro-Magnums and Neanderthals. And so these guys are goal-oriented, they're team-oriented. So all the time in American corporations, you get this thing like, we must do this team-building exercise. And like engineers who are often, you know, fat, red-headed guys and stuff, they're like, this is agony for them. The social thing, the team-building, this, why are we doing this shit? It's because the manager is a you know, sub-Saharan bred uh, crow magnum and he's he's thinking in terms of we do stuff by getting together we must be they're always on vision and goal and stuff like this and all the engineers are going what the fuck you know just like stop torturing me like do you want some software here go to the moon <laughs> and then these guys we must go to the moon it's like the is like why <laughs> so the you know the they're both kind of safe on their own because there's the crow magnums would could never get to the moon because they, they're just not engineers they were, couldn't couldn't even begin to think of an engineering thought that could get them to the moon and the, the neanderthals they're engineers they can get you to the moon they just can't see what the fucking point is but you put the two together and you can see that basically they then you know they have these guys that are fool enough to go to the moon and these guys who are engineer enough to get them there. And it's like, you know, but it's crazy. The whole thing is a marriage made in hell. And so that's, that's the two of them together. Okay. Yeah. That makes some sense. Um, yeah. Cause I watched this. I will have to see if I can find it, but it's this anthropology thing where he talked about Neanderthals and how 
um, when Cro Magnum or whatever Devonian people were coming out of Africa or the East, the the he said that uh, it seemed that the Neanderthals didn't like them because they talked too much, and so they started moving away. <laughs> yeah, the, so the so that's yeah that that makes sense that the Neanderthals are, um, you know, really? don't like the chat. I, I I see that myself too. I don't like it when people chat too much, so I like go to a quiet place. <laughs> Well, well, you see, you're an artist and stuff like that. But so, if you have a look at um, that movie, The Office Space, not not The Office, The Office Space was an was an older movie about these these engineers in a software company in America. And if you saw that movie, you'll see that, that there's this archetypical manager guy. He's still used as a meme all over the place. But but he is the typical Cro Magnum guy. And uh, then you you know the guy who's the Neanderthal is the the guy with the red stapler you know and the, who who <laughs> who basically eventually gets put in the down in the uh, basement. But if you see that movie, you can clearly see the archetypes. And it's you know I I saw this ages ago, so long before they knew that we had Neanderthal in us. I speculated. I thought like I, I swear we're a hybrid. But nothing made any sense to me. It was like, how how can you get white so quickly from black black on, in about um, thirty thousand years? It, it seemed like awful quick. And so gradually, I started just in the office place realizing that, like, no, come on, we're two different species in one. And um, but man, that idea was ever unpopular. But then Francie Pabo and those guys came in twenty eleven and said, no, we, and that, they just about knocked everybody's socks off. And so, you know, that was a gut punch. But the but the other people saw the same thing I did. I remember seeing long ago in early in the 2000s, this, this op-ed in Nature. It was just a bit of frivolous thing where somebody said exactly the same thing. They made this thing about uh, the engineers bringing the cro magnums and uh, kind of red hairish white ones <laughs> and the managers being clueless fucking idiots who uh, cro magnums. And, and and so you know it was just kind of a laugh piece, but I think a lot of people have seen the same same thing. What yeah, was so it? The born out of, I look at the science. It's born out. Yeah. Yeah. So the basically the hybridization um, combined the goal oriented and engineering aspects of those two species into the alien cortex, and that's our problem, isn't it? That's that's our problem. Yeah. So ah, we're okay. all engineers, and we're going to start geoengineering. But you see, it, it it's all the genetics shows this, the linguistics shows this, and then you know where, where they two species met for the first time was uh, in in the Middle East, basically where the Black Sea is now. So you can clearly see the this AR1 gene and the the um, it it spreads with the Trapelian people. So if you have a look at the Trapelians and and the the, the Aryans, um, they they Aryans and what they they can tell from linguistics that the guys, you know, uh, domesticated the horse, they invented the wheel. So wherever chariots and wheels go and horses, horse chariots go, you know that's the, the Aryans. And so, yeah, but an incredible amount they can tell from linguistics, but they know they're patriarchal, that they they uh, do blood sacrifices to the sun. That's all sun worship, solar worship. That's the swastika and all of that. <laughs> But you know what I think the swastika is is um, is a basket. It's a basket weave. So the the I the the extinction ID symbol is it also includes some of the basket. But if if you want me to go over the rather incredibly fascinating story of where the, where the basket comes in, <laughs> but the basket is is part of um, life rituals and rebirth. Um, it's uh, uh, it, uh, the reason why it's a symbol of the swastika is a symbol of rebirth. Is the uh, what what it, that um, that cross there, the tetragrammion, is is really how you start a basket. You if you've ever made a basket, you fold things over in four and you just carry on doing that. And you say, well, what's this? There's a number of things they're trying to point to there. One of them is baskets in hunter gatherer times in the ice age. That that's um, you know women would have been sowing the first agricultural seed, so they're hunting, they're gathering into the thing, but a basket has always been um, associated with the feminine and the womb. 
So the firmament and the big dome on top of us, they saw it as a big dome, a big upside down bowl is how they saw the sky. And they thought of it as, as Gaia's womb, Nut's womb. So they thought of us in a big basket. And so uh, that, the, the kind of eye and the start of the basket is, is analogous to a birth canal. So they thought we went through a birth canal, probably in Deneb. But, but anyway, that's a, a long story, but that, that's truly, truly fascinating stuff. And I'll I'll just say, that and, yeah. they, so they have say, all the... Go on, go on, it's okay. So they, they had all these like deep spiritual insights and stuff, but I guess um, it all got pushed aside for the goal-oriented, you know, agricultural empire stuff, huh? Because that really appealed to the uh, psychology, I, or how that worked. I think they, I think they were stable. They probably kept slaves, right? There's some indication they kept slaves, but the I think what what it is is they all sitting around the Black Sea, and then the, the around seven thousand years ago, then the Black Sea deluged, and so uh, caused a flood which displaced them all, and so particularly they they all go in different directions. Um, east, west, south, and there's the Trapillians and go up. They're basically going up the valleys. So they go up the Danube and the Volga and stuff like that. But the guys that go up the Danube, um, they eventually get to Ireland and the swastika and stuff goes with them. But those guys are Trapillians and the Trapillians are out and out bastards. They, you know, wherever they moved, they thought they were superior. So by the time they arrive in India, they all, you know, Aryan Brahmins and, um, the Arapa people, the Dravidians and stuff, they quash them. So wherever they go, they just kind of quash them. And they, yeah, they, they genocidal, but well, it's, it's me. <laughs> it's my answers. Well, genocidal bastards. So they all move concrete. And the, the reason is Klaus Schwab. I mean, Klaus Schwab is typical guy. He's just, he thinks he's superior, just like sort everybody out, put them into line, kill them if they don't, you know, fit. Hugh, you, you mentioned something uh, not too long ago uh, in this call uh, about an article in, in Nature or something by by someone around 2012 or something, um, just, just a few minutes ago, and I, I couldn't get the, the name. So I, I, I just remember this article where somebody had exactly the same thought I did, and they put it in in these kind of you know, flippant pieces in the, in the back, you know, just fun pieces. Um, and, and so it was just a, a fun short story of just, uh, you know, no, this you, woman in, you, in, 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 a, in a lab setting. I can't, you, I can't you remember mentioned, what this is. You mentioned a name that shocked everyone, or like a, something that shocked everyone. Oh, Francie Pabo. Yeah, What? how do you spell that? Ah, <laughs> um. Uh, Francie is, you know, I think as you'd say, then Pabo is P A A B E with an umlaut over the A. Okay. Uh, no, P P A A B O with an umlaut over the over the first A. So Francie Pabo was, uh, he got some DNA out of a Neanderthal tooth. Nobody thought you could do that, and he sequenced it. And uh, well, the first major thing they wanted to find is 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 there any of that in in um, in the human genome because the human genome was just sequenced in 2001. Um, so they, they so uh, everybody waited with bated breath. I mean, the scientific establishment were absolutely sure that there was zero of this troglodyte subhuman shit. And uh, you know they they were bowled over when Francis Bauer said, "No, there's uh, it's about one percent to four um, percent in." Uh, and here's the real shocker. In uh, everybody other than sub Saharan Africans. So then that's a racist thing again. So that was a little, another strike against poor old Francie there. And then um, they, uh, but it was unequivocal. So then they tried to downplay it. One of the awkward things is Ashkenazi Jews in particular have more. <laughs> um, they have up to 4%. But so, so of course, then the prejudice never dies, and they say, "Oh, it's a, it's a tiny amount." Well, the thing to notice is about this tiny amount is one percent doesn't work. It's not paint, right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's like one percent. You know, you you can have a couple of percentage difference between a gorilla and us. So, like one percent is a lot. 
I mean, it's basically what you're looking at. After 32 generations, there should be none. So if you're looking at 1%, you're looking at a pure hybrid. It's like people like me, white people, are pure 50-50 hybrid. And that's proven by the fact that in that 1% is about 70% of the Neanderthal's genome is still extant in that 1%. So in that one to four percent is the the major part of which which is saying to you that you know it, it's kind of imagine that you you know you got a labradoodle ten thousand you know thirty thousand years ago and you crossbred it and you say well how much of a poodle is left in that and it's like if one percent is left thirty thousand years ago that's a solid hybrid man it just <laughs> that's just a one for one hybrid so yeah that's um, the, the spelling is S C A N T E. Spante. Oh, yeah. I thought it was Francie. Yeah, Spante. Oh, yeah, sorry. S V A N T. Sorry, I led you astray there. I thought it was Francie, but Fr Svante. Oh, uh, yeah. Svante Pabo. Did I get the rest right? Uh, yeah. P um, A A B O with uh, it, it's like Ooh. a Finnish, Finnish spelling with two, two dots on both A's. Yeah, he's Czech. Yeah, I think he's Czech. But, but oh, um, uh, yeah, they, they've uh, they've since gone and found a lot more um, DNA. But anyway, that the whole thing about that he's, is he's uh, actually is Swedish. Fascinating. Swedish. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought he was Czech. Okay. Yeah, and that's not good too. That's a bit of a strike against him too, because the the guys were kind of quick to say, "Oh, this is Nazi science." <laughs> and it's like. Ah, ah, ah. You see, this this is this is the, the holy grail. This is like this is everybody's tiptoeing around this with, with you know all the hot button subjects, Jews and Aryans and you know, Can I just and, um and this I, is it. I had a they, they don't they don't want to face the this true story. Yeah. I, I just want to insert a little bit of a point here. I was listening to the uh the radio and there's a uh, uh, a well-known composer, uh, a con conductor and pianist. His name is Vladimir Ashkenazi. And uh, I was listening to the radio one day and everybody pronounces this guy's name, Vladimir Ashkenazi. And this one announcer came on one day and he said, uh, you know, that was Beethoven's Sonata Number So-and-So played by Vladimir Ashkenazi. And I suddenly woke up. <laughs> it's... <laughs> This, this, he, by pronouncing the name differently, the guy had had said a lot, you know. But uh, it, it you is, know? A, yeah, it's it's funny as hell because it's it's staring everybody in the face. It's just like it's unmentionable. So, well, but but every, everybody knows. I mean, you look look at look at the Zionists. And look at the Nazis. And so, like, what's the difference? There's one of, one of the first founders. I can't can't remember who he is now. Not Ben Gurion, but one one of the 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 established um, really ideologues that established uh, Israel. He said that there's no difference between Zionists and Nazis. He said that basically, so Zionists are Nazis. That's just a different country. And he was one of the founders. So, but uh, yeah, that's so. You say, well, what, what is this? This there's some unique phenomenon. And they're like, yeah, this whole duel between the two of them is self-loathing, self-loathing, the alien cortex hating itself. These these are battles between brothers, close brothers. Oh, so is this? A, it's also analogous to the uh, the. Pandava and Nakarava in the Mahabharata. You see that they're, they're the same people. They they call themselves Aryans. You see. But it, it's yeah. so charged now. You can't even use the right words. The people jump through hoops to try and. Is that, uh, is that Theodore feel. Herzl, or is that before? Is that Theodore Herzl? Oh, the, it might have been. Yeah, it sounds Mahabharata. like Herzl. It's a, it sounds yeah. like the kind of thing he would have said. You know. Yeah, yeah but. But uh, yeah, many people have said this. I thing. think he was before Nazis. Yeah, yes. I think he wrote. He wrote. He his was like the guy who invented the Zionism. Century, so before the Nazis, yeah. Yeah. So right. been, yeah. How long? When did, like when did Herzl die? When did Herzl die? I don't know. 
But I think it might have been someone like Jabotinsky or one of those, because you had those sort of terrorist uh, organizations. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's a bloke now who's uh, writing a book. There's a few books being written about collaboration between uh, sort of Zionist Europeans and uh, the Nazi regime at the time. And this is like one of those things. Ken Livingstone, a British politician, got thrown out of the Labour Party for making a comment that said something. Well, obviously, the Zionists were in cahoots with the Nazis or some, something. Uh, don't quote me on that, but something like that. And he got kicked out of the Labour Party. And, um, you know, it's true that the, or you know, certain uh, elements within early Zionism uh, were looking at Nazi Germany as a sort of favorable phenomenon, which would help usher uh, in the creation of a sort of Jewish state, because obviously that crisis, well, it would lead to what it did, which is, you know, the, um, yeah. All right, there you go. Thank you. Uh, well, that's in 1904 according to Sophie. So, oh, okay. So it wouldn't have been him. So that's, yeah. that's a bit too early. It's, it's somebody that overlapped. Yeah. But, but the, no, but I mean, like, the, a lot of those guys were like really supremacist, you know, indistinguishable. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I, I think that the, the difference, in my take on it, which is somewhat personal, is that they're, the sort of Zionist contingent are worse than Nazis because the Nazis didn't raise their children on a diet of look how awful Nazis are. So, um, well, as far as I know, anyway, maybe I'm uh, not no, aware. No, they did the opposite. They said, look look how nasty Jews are. And so it was like the same thing. But yeah, the, the, but, uh, yeah the, 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 the Zionists uh, had a secret agreement with the, with the Germans to funnel uh, Jews to, to Israel. And so they... Yeah, the 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 Hitler sent all these um, you know Jews in exile, like the Voyage of the Damned and stuff, and these ships to Palestine to kind of goad Britain and stuff and America because no no one would take the ships. They didn't, and they said, "Well, we don't want to aid your policy, so you know, aid aid your uh, pogrom." But uh, the 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 British actually. British soldiers actually fended off one of the ships that uh, tried to land in Palestine, one of the for, with Jewish refugees. I think they had to go back to Germany, and they probably wound up dead in the concentration camp. But the the, the British couldn't didn't want to allow Jews into Palestine, so they had to make a secret agreement with the Germans and funnel them in. <laughs> Any, anyway, what's interesting about all the stories, the propaganda all over Langer, what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed not, you know, it's so strict and, and uniform. And so you said, like, what, By the what, way, what are they trying to hide? Uh, during, that, during that time, Shanghai was the only place in the world other than, I think, uh, Dominican Republic that accepted those refugees. So there's a huge... Jewish presence in Shanghai, and there's there's a uh, or at least um, original uh, there used to be, um, and and it got to the point where it was there were people like the the Catteries and the um, some some of the other families that were so powerful that they they essentially built the Bund and and these kind of things in there and um, financed uh, the Guomindang. Uh, the KMT, uh, uh, largely, um, so they, they had a deal with them so that they could, uh, they would accept the bonds and, uh, get high, high yields on them from the government. And so they backed that government over the, the communists and stuff. But, um, er early on, um, the, the, when Japan invaded, they thought that they, um, that the, those Jews were actually the, the real people in charge in China. And so um, they, they tried to- They turn, probably were. Yeah, they, 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 they were the financiers. So they, they tried to turn- Gosh, those, the, that shocks me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, they tried to turn those guys um, uh, to, to Japan um, and failed. So um, the- it, it's fascinating there it's actually the the family one of the families was um the the manager for the the finances for like for like 500 years or something that family 
uh, for for in Baghdad. There are Iraqi Jews that came to Shanghai and, and made, made a name for themselves. And the, um, the, uh, uh, they, they managed, like, for, I think it was for the Ottoman Empire or something, had, had all the financing um, uh, for, for the Sultan. Yeah, uh, yeah we, for... we forget. We, we forget in our, in our Western bias that uh, the center of the world from most of the last 2,000 years was Samarkand. So it's it's in Kazakhstan and all the place we think is all like now, nah. but you know the Silk Roads and stuff all went through through the still to this day. I mean the BRI and stuff is just the Silk Roads, but the yeah. but now uh, it's the pipeline roads. <laughs> yeah, the oil pipeline. Same. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. There, there's a there's a book called The Last Kings of Shanghai, I believe. Um, and it's all about this this story that's just really untold um, in most of. Uh, uh, but but there were there were more Jews in Shanghai than in any other place in in the earth. More more Jewish refugees in Shanghai than any other place on earth during during the nineteen forties. Um, yeah, my yeah. great grandmother lived there. Strangely enough. Interesting. Shanghai. Yeah, I don't know anything about. I don't know anything about it. You've piqued my interest. It's it's rather interesting that they they almost wound up in Madagascar. So the uh, the British wanted them to go to Madagascar, but the Ben Gurion and those guys didn't want. It was that or uh, Uganda. Yeah, Uganda as well. Actually, they're very lucky they didn't go to Uganda because all the Indians there got slaughtered with Idi Amin. Oh no, they were going to give them Uganda as the, as the you know it would have been their country. They would have they would have had apartheid there. That would have been all. They would have had yeah. They were going to set up a Jewish state in Uganda. That was that was a that, an idea. That, I think that was in Herzl's day already. Well, they, well, that would have had apartheid just like South Africa, so that would have been awkward. Oh, yeah, it? absolutely. Well, you know, they were going to do it one way or another, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Apartheid, that, well, that's the big thing about Aryans, is apartheid. Apartheid and Aryans go like this, right? So wherever you see apartheid, and I'm talking about the jabs now, that's the little demon in the left forebrain here. But, yeah, well... We should end it there because it's like gone a long stretch. Yeah, I got another half hour out of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unintentionally though, unintentionally. Yeah, I, I would, I would love to do the, the, I would love to do the ancient um, archaeology and uh, the ancient religion and and all of that stuff. Yeah, that, yeah, that, I'm super. Really... I, I'm personally super interested in that stuff. Yeah, yeah. and then another thing I want to say is I, I find it just humorous like darkly humorous that like you know the scientists and stuff were sketchy about the history it's like you look at the last 500 years and it's literally white people conquering you know uh indigenous people or killing each other over you know resources it's like oh, oh. You, 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 if you if you want something darkly funny then go, go and have a look at the lava flow theory because it's, what you're talking about there was a, a theory, a Victorian theory called the lava flow theory. Clearly, it's 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 not wrong if you. It's actually supported by the genetics, and what it shows is that you know somewhere around the Black Sea, they always say the steps because they look at a modern map. But clearly, it's the Black Sea before it floods. The flooding probably made them migrate, so they had a big exodus. But the the uh, um, this exodus then moves and they conquer everybody as they go. And then, you know, gradually Victorian explorers and, you know, missionaries and stuff, they piece, started to piece this together with all these fragmentary evidence and bits of language and words that kept on cropping up in places where they should. And they gradually said, look, there's a big center around the middle. And then there's this love, like all these other guys get pushed out. Like you look at India, all the Dravidians, all the first guys, you know, if you look at the Picts and all those, the first guys in the British Isles, they all pushed west. So everybody's been pushed. And so they made this theory called, you know, the, the lava flow theory. Now, 
it's considered so fucking charged and racist that it's it's banned from the books you know you you you'll struggle to find anything about it but it's clearly it's correct <laughs> but it's um they they just scrub it you know it's just like it's just they they won't even look at it won't even discuss it it's because they know it's right they just just they, it's just politically incorrect yeah the it seems just the whole like culture that's been created is desperate not to self reflect that's what it seems like yeah, it's yeah, just utterly desperate yeah, not to self reflect yeah, that's exactly the way I interpret it. All of it is an elaborate scheme so the alien cortex doesn't look at itself. The whole struggle, the struggle in this Neanderthal um, Cro-Magnum hybrid is uh, self-awareness. It's, it's the beast looking at itself. That's, that's the story of the Western world. That's the story of McGillcrite's uh, divided brain and the master and the emissary. It's this uh, struggle not to look at itself in the mirror. But in essence, the the this bad hybrid forces it to to look at itself you uh the lava flow theory reminds me in a way of the uh concept of the sotetic zone i don't know if you've heard of that which was put forward of the kind of uh um mediterranean races having a different moral um position uh than the then these sort of more refined white people further out i don't know if there's any connection or not in in that just just uh reminded me of it a bit well yeah i mean you see it again and again because the guys are like it's particularly interested in, in india because it looks like a layer cake and you can mm. see the the Dr dravidians were the last guys um, the the really rural guys, the um, Tamils and the guys in the southern tip of India, they they're very very dark, and a lot of the Shudra, the untouchables, um, Dalits and stuff, they they down there. But those guys looked like Aboriginal Australians, and when they looked at the yeah. genes, they said, "Oh yeah, these guys are like, you know, they're sixty thousand years old, right? They've been there for sixty thousand years." But the it looks like the Australasian, the, the Aborigines, they were beachcombers. And they went around <laughs> India around the coast. Through the islands, yeah. Yeah, but the the, the, the guys, the, it was sheer, clearly there were successive invasions to India. And then you see India's culture is very layered. So by the time the, the, the last guys, the Aryans come in, they come with Shiva. Shiva's, you know, white. <laughs> and the, they... They clearly don't struggle to tell them about the caste system and stuff because already it's kind of a layer cake. But they, that's why they, they're embarrassed about Kali and stuff. She's the mother goddess. She's very, very old goddess. And then they have newer and newer religions. So Krishna and stuff is blue. You know, he's Dravidian. <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. All right. All right, let's uh, stop there. We better stop. <laughs> Can go on all night. Anyway, just pause a moment and uh, and reflect. Reflect. Do the Aryans, the undoing of the Aryans, reflection. So try and reflect during the week and try not to let other people deflect you from reflecting. All right. Thank we'll you. Do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Thank you very much. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Thank I'll you. Have you. Bye. Okay. I'll have the out soon. Bye. Awesome. All right. All right. Smooth sailing.